Good evening. I would like to call this meeting to order for a November 2nd, 2023. Will you all please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Reed. Here. Vice Mayor Woods. Here, ma'am. Council Member Tinsley. Here. Council Member Primoroso. Here. Council Member Middleton. Here. Thank you so much, Patty. All right. Are there any additions, deletions, or modifications to our agenda this evening? No, ma'am. Thank you. We're going to move right into our announcements and presentations. The first presentation will be from Doug Faber, our city manager from the city of Crystal River. If you would kindly come up to the podium, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you uh, for on behalf of the City of Crystal River. I come here today with my Public Works Director from the City of Crystal River, Troy Slattery. Um, we were the recipients of some very kind-hearted folks uh, and employees and here in the City of um, Palm Beach Gardens. We um, have been through a couple bad weeks here lately in, um, in the City of Crystal River, and we are the, the gym of the Nature Coast, and we pride ourselves on a lot of those type of things. About 30 days after I started in the city of Crystal River, we experienced Hurricane Idalia. So it flooded nearly 40% of the homes in Crystal River um, and putting many, many, many people out of their houses. Um, without the hard work of all the residents to be as resilient as they are, uh, the city staff would not be able to be in a position where we are to keep moving the city forward. Uh, with that, we came across a phone call from um, David Reyes here uh, with the city of Palm Beach Gardens as well as from your city manager and the city manager from Callaway, Eddie Cook. Uh, they offered to do the sister city program, which I had heard about through my times in Bay County at the city of Mexico Beach, um, that had also been through a little bit of disaster there over the years. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to, to accept some uh, great opportunities from you guys, uh, not only for the residents, we got hit pretty hard as some of the staff employees had been hit as well throughout the flood. A lot of them live in town. And then they weren't able to get to work to do their job, so with the city, of Palm Beach Gardens, the ability to help us by sending over several crews after the immediate impact of the storm helped us open up our storm water, help the water to reside. We had, we had things that we'd never seen before. Uh, airboat rescues going down Highway 19 in the middle of town. We had manatees floating behind the drive through at Wendy's. We had things that you just can't possibly imagine for a city to go through, and, and we pulled out of it. So with the help of your guys' team um, here, we want to try to give back a little bit and show some recognition for you folks and all that you guys did. And maybe not everybody knows the hard work that your staff did, but I would like for to give Troy about a minute if I could. He could kind of tell some of the, some of the things that you guys had with the city. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I appreciate the time to speak with you. Um, give you a little bit of background. I've been in public services, many different categories, over 35 years. For the first time in my career, I got to be on the receiving end of a strike team to come up and offer us a few hands of assistance. Um, when your team came down to help us, it took about two days and we were able to reopen all five of our city parks back to the public. In addition to that, we opened our stormwater uh, main canals and we were able to focus, some of my team was able to stay focused on our roads. Within a week of the hurricane, our city was back to life. And as a result of that, I want to say thank you to you and especially to the public works individuals uh, and David and his staff that came down to give us that hand. Uh, incredible to see that their level of professionalism and their loyalty to us as strangers was impeccable. In fact, uh, Daniel and I stay in contact frequently as a result of that. So I've got a friend for life, I hope. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Uh, one last thing that I would like to leave with you before I go into the presentation of the key to the city from Crystal River um, is we had an employee who lost everything. Um, he had two small children. He's a retired Marine. And I don't know if you've ever seen a Marine cry, but this was a time where he did. And this, this man came in. He's a ranger. He's a ranger, park ranger for us in the cities. And, and he had absolutely nothing, displaced two small children. And your, your team and the city and came through together with so many things. It wasn't just like the gift cards and things that would help him buy necessities that he needed. I mean, it was all the, the clothes and things that came. The biggest thing, he told me to tell you thank you for what he said. Uh, his name is John Riddler. Uh, he's a park ranger for the city. And he said that the, the personal notes from the children 
that they put in those boxes with those cards. I mean, it gets me choked up talking about it, watching him as he was reading through those together. But he said those will be framed on his wall, and he couldn't be more proud of, of it's hard to take things. You guys know that. It's hard to be on the receiving end of things like that of need when you're in need. And he was just as grateful as he possibly could. So thank you guys very much for all of that. Um, I'm actually on here, here on behalf of the mayor of Crystal River, Joe Meek. Um, he's asked me to present a plaque. I've got a beautiful key to the city. I'd like to read that to you if you got a second. So this is on behalf of Joe Meek. So it's inbred in his person, so it's not me. <laughs> Uh, the key to the city is presented to commemorate, reward, or recognize a memorable event, outstanding partnership, or endowment. In recognition of such, this key to the city is being presented to the city of Palm Beach Gardens with thanks and appreciation from the city of Crystal River and those who reside here. Those that go above and beyond the normal become the local heroes that are part of our best resource. I have hereunto set my hand and cause to be affixed to the official seal of the city of Crystal River, Florida, this second day of November, 2023, Honorable Joe Meek, Mayor. I would like to get a picture if I could. Um, it'd be exciting for me. And thank you guys so much. All right, we'll be right down, it's amazing. <laughs> Oh, wait, don't go quite yet. We wanted to say thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to, to be a part of your city. This is not the first time we've had a, a sister city, unfortunately, but safety is always the most important thing for, um, for all of us here and our extraordinary staff. Um, if anyone wants to hear the story uh, of what happened with this city, just go back and watch our meeting from last month. It's pretty extraordinary. And, and David Reyes and his team, you had, you had folks out there within hours to help you're on the phone right away, so thank you so much. It's a reflection of how much we care about our communities. Anything else from council? All right, all right. Thank you guys so much for coming, and thank you for thank you for the key to the city. We'll we'll be over. We'll be right over. All right. So um, next, I'm I'm really excited about this. We are going to take another moment for an initiative that council just approved recently where um, during our budget hearings, we had a discussion about the possibility of supporting our local public schools. And there are 10 public schools within the city of Palm Beach Gardens, and um, not necessarily incorporated Palm Beach Gardens, but within our area. And we felt it was important as a council to support those schools. And so we went through our city manager and our finance department to allow for a $5,000 per year per school donation for the 10 public schools over the next 10 years. And we're gonna take a moment and draw them out of a hat 
Okay, we're going to come down and join you. Ready? Okay. All right. So, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have each council member draw one school. So, luckily, there are five of us and ten schools within the area. And thank you so much to the principals who came to join us tonight. Um, some of us are so lucky to get to spend time in your schools. Please keep inviting us. We will come again and again. The more we know about your needs, the better we can serve our residents, and we take it very seriously. And we're so thankful for everything you guys do every day. Are you ready? All right, so I'm gonna hold this and you get to choose. First. Oh, no, I'll go last, it's fine. Yeah, are you ready? Vice Mayor, where's the Vice Mayor? Okay, so the City of Palm Beach Gardens public school donation is, and the winner for the first year, 2023, is... <laughs> <laughs> Carl's gonna take a little while, here we go. Okay, who is it? Marsh Point Marsh Elementary Point, School. 2023. Marsh Point, come up. Are you here? Well, we're going to take a picture afterwards After. of everybody. Yep, okay. okay. They're there. All right, Marcy. Okay, okay, you ready? Number two. Okay. Okay. All right, and so the next, <laughs> the next school to be drawn for the year 2024, $5,000. Who's it going to be? Oh, boy. Drum roll. Pierce Hammock. Pierce Hammock. All right. <laughs> All right, Dana. Oh, I'm starting to pull one out. Uh-oh. You want to go next? No. Here we go. All right. Put your hand in. Drum roll. All right. All right. That says Timber, Timber Trace. Trace Elementary. Congratulations, Timber Trace. 2025, I believe. All right, Bert. You got it. My school hat. There you go. My school bus hat. Palm Beach Gardens Elementary. Yay! Okay, six. All right. All right. I'm going in. I'm not looking. Let's see. Hal Watkins Middle School. Next up. Okay, come on around again, guys. Carl, you're up again. Yeah. Everybody gets to draw too. Okay. Thank you for making. I won't screw around. With our bus hat. Palm Beach Gardens High School. Woohoo! Thanks. All right. You got that? All right. Next. Next. Shake. <coughs> Alamanda. Woo! Three more to go. Three more to go. You're doing great. Okay, you got go. it. Dwight D. Eisenhower. Okay. And, okay. and a pair of reading you. glasses. Congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got to be principal for the day the other day at, at Eisenhower. It was extraordinary. All right. Well, go ahead, Bert. We've got Watson B. Duncan Middle School. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. And last but absolutely not least is Dwyer High School for our 10 year out program. So what will happen now is every year, um, every year for the next 10 years, each school will receive $5,000 per our budget and per council approval. So make sure you guys stay involved. Anytime you receive that $5,000 or every year anyway, please come back and let us know what you did with it and the amazing effect it had on our community for our children. And thank you again for all you do. Come on up for a photo.
Thank you all so much. We'll see you guys each year. We can't wait to hear all about it. Next up, we have an update from Palm Tran, and I thought I saw Yash Nagal come in. Hey, now, hi there, come on. How are you, come on up. Oh, Clinton, you're here, I didn't see you. <laughs> I apologize, yes, all Madam right, Mayor. hello sir. Clinton Forbes is here, Executive Director of Palm Tran. If you could give us your update, my apologies. Thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the council. Mem council uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for your service. I'm joined by Yash Nagal, who is the Director of Transit Planning at Palm Tran, and Deborah Posey Blocker, who is the governor, Governmental Affairs Leader. Um, I do recognize, Madam uh, Mayor, that you have a very aggressive agenda. Uh, and so I will be brief. You will see that I will skip over several slides in recognition uh, of, of brevity. So um, I don't know who's going to cue this presentation up for me. All right, thank you for that. Um, again, Clinton Forbes, Executive Director of Palm Tran. Um, you know, I just, just want to take a 30 seconds on this slide. This, I think, really is, um, uh, you know, illustrates what we do at Palm Tran um, in terms of the human capital and the, you know, uh, the, the, the capital assets, the rolling stock that we use. That's our mission statement. We provide access to opportunity for everyone. Um, and the pillars of that mission statement is we do it safely, efficiently, and courteously. The second pillar is what we're talking about today, and that is efficiency. You know, recognizing that we are fiduciaries uh, of, the, of the public dollar, uh, and that we have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that we spend the public's tax dollars wisely. And so, this is our agenda. Again, we'll skip over uh, some of these items in interests of time. I'm um, just on the progress to date on, on these changes that we're ushering in in Palm Tran that affects Palm Beach Gardens. Um, we have had a board workshop in September with the Board of County Commissioners uh, that the board directed us to meet with our board at Palm Tran, the Palm Tran Service Board, uh, to get our recommendations, to, to have feedback from the public on those recommendations. We held that meeting on October 26th. Um, we anticipate the board ratifying our plan on November 28th, and the board also directed us to meet with all of the affected and impacted municipalities you know, with these changes. So as you can see, and we have the chair of the TPA, the Transportation Planning Agency here. We met uh, with the TPA on October 19th and the city of Royal Palm. If you'd like to talk, you know, learn what was said at that meeting, we could share that. Uh, Riviera Beach uh, and Palm Beach Gardens, of course, we're here tonight and the village of Wellington is set for uh, December 5th. These are all of the affected areas by these changes. So we're here to talk about, um, we have three modes of transit, uh, fixed route, paratransit, and mobility on demand. We are here to talk about fixed route and paratransit, just to isolate that for you, and we'll jump right into the presentation. So um, we are um, redesigning how we deliver uh, public transit, we call it a part of our Route Performance Maximization Project 2.0. Um, the first uh, uh, map that you see there uh, indicates uh, Route 33 and Route 20, and Route 21 also traverses this area. The recommendation uh, that we made to our board was to eliminate Route 21, that essentially you know, traverses along that corridor, you know, Prosperity Road Farm, to the gardens. Uh, it was somewhat of a very circuitous route. And modify the routes 20 and 33 to provide coverage and add, that's something new, a new approach here, a transport network company voucher pilot program. This Route 21 served major destinations like Garden Small, uh, Palm Beach Gardens, Palm Beach State College, Azuri States, that's in Riviera, uh, Magnolia Park Tri-Rail, in the municipalities affected, Palm Beach Gardens, North Palm Beach, Lake Park, Riviera Beach, and Mangonia uh, Park. So our recommendation here uh, is to eliminate Route 21 and replace it with a transport network company voucher program. That means we'll be partnering with Uber and Lyft and taxis 
uh, to provide some of the coverage of the areas that we are eliminating. This, er this essentially uh, community will emerge with better mobility than it had before on Route 21. Route 21 is one of our lower performing routes out of the 31 routes we have. I think it's number 30. Um, we spend approximately $1.1 million annualized to operate the route. And we carry, as I like to joke with my staff, we carry air conditioning. So it's about 1.1 boardings uh, a day on that route. Um, and so that's not efficient. That's not spending tax, the taxpayers' dollars wisely. And so we are replacing it with this uh, mobility option, which actually is better transit. Um, for example, the annualized cost of the route is 1.1 million. The introduction of this Uber Lyft partnership will be about 150 to 200 thousand dollars annualized. That's our estimate. So, uh, essentially, we, the reason why I say that you emerge with better transit because you still have Route 33 and 20 that we have modified to make to cover some of the areas. And then you have overlaid, that's the blue, light blue shaded area, which we call a zone. That's where the TNC will operate. And so on fixed route, essentially a fixed route is, of course, our big 40-foot buses. In order to use the fixed route, every transit trip must begin with a pedestrian trip, a cycling trip, or someone drop you to the bus stop. You have to get to the bus stop, unless, of course, you're fortunate enough to have the bus stop in front of your business or your home. You have to get to the bus stop. With this approach, we take you from your doorstep of your home within this zone to your destination or to a connecting bus stop that can take you a longer distance. And so we'll talk to you more about how that. So we're doing this in three areas of the county. Palm Beach Gardens, where we've identified a very low performing route. Route 52 in Royal Palm, which is at the bottom of the list in terms of productivity. We're eliminating that route totally, if you're familiar with Royal Palm in the Western community. And in Boca Raton, at the southern part, the southeast part of Boca Raton. So, um, but we won't talk about those unless you have questions. We'll just talk about this area. So just really quickly, in terms of our savings to do this. So we, we asked the board to eliminate Route 21 and 52, which, are the, which is the lion's share of the $2.4 million you see here. There's some other modifications, but the lion's share of those $2.4 million savings it, are the elimination of 21 and 52. We asked the board to allow us to reinvest the 2.4 million back into the system. Don't claw those dollars, allow us to reinvest them back into the system. And with that, we're gonna introduce the three pilot TNC voucher programs, uh, which will provide coverage for the re eliminated routes and increase the peak weekday frequency of route three from 30 to 20 minutes and Sunday from 60 to 30 minutes, which of course affects um, Palm Beach Gardens is one of our most productive routes. If you can look on the right of this slide, that uh, sort of magenta line that goes up the spine of the county from Palm Beach Gardens to Boca Raton is one of our most productive routes. It's 30 minute service. We wanna dial up the frequency to 20 minutes. That means the bus comes every 20 minutes. And when you do that, when you have a route that is linear, that travels along a dense area, and that is frequent, it equals ridership. It equals better usability. We also have some other um, minor modifications or reinvestments we won't go into. <clears throat> and this is just, uh, just really quickly, when you dial up the frequency, this is just an example of what happens. We did it on Route 43 in Okeechobee, as you can see from 2021 to 2022, 15% increase from 2022 to 2023. 22% increase. And we expect the same to happen for Route 3, uh, that, that reinvestment. This is how Route 3 looks now during peak periods. Uh, in tran the transit industry, we like to, like, like to see this photo, right? I mean, this is ridership. This is what we call a crush load. And, um, but it's not as convenient for the customer. So we are going to provide some relief 
by introducing more frequent service. And while doing that, we have to uh, add about six buses, which will provide a little more convenience and seating for uh, this route. Here are the three uh, TNC voucher pilot programs and the areas. And this is how it works. So a person, uh, and I'm, I'm, I have Route 52 up here uh, just for illustration, because um, this is pro that's probably the most impactful change because they, we're taking all of the fixed route out of this area. So just as an illustration, a customer will, just like you would hail an Uber or Lyft, you'll pull out your phone from your home and you'll select an Uber or Lyft. That Uber or Lyft will come to the doorstep of your home or the curb. You will then select your origination point where you have done that in advance, just like uh, Uber and Lyft you do today. It's very intuitive. And that destination could be a, a bus stop that we have geocoded in the zone within 400 feet of that bus stop. And so that Uber and Lyft, you will pay $2. Right now on the fixed route, the fare is $2, right? You'll pay $2 initially for the trip and we will subsidize, we will provide you a voucher for $8. So that's the $10 essentially value that you can travel using the Uber and Lyft. We estimate that that value will get you between two and a half to three miles within the zone. You cannot travel outside of the zone. So if you, if you don't even wanna to connect to a bus stop and go a longer distance, and you wanna to go to Publix or my favorite restaurant, Christopher's, or um, you know, to the barber shop or the Publix, you can hail that vehicle from your home, and if that, vehicle, if that is within the zone two and a half miles, you can take it directly to that location if there's a bus stop geocoded in that area. And if there's not, and that's a place of destination, we can put a place of bus stop there and geocode it. <clears throat> if you travel more than two and a half to three miles, then you carry the additional freight, but you have to still do it within the zone. So let's say you traveled five miles and that trip came up to $14. You will pay the initial $2, we will subsidize eight, and at the end of your trip, you have an additional $4 to pay. So that's essentially how it works. Um, if, a if, if a customer does not have a smartphone or requires an 88 vehicle, an 88 accessible taxi will be deployed by telephone. Now, as you know, Uber and Lyft, they do not drug and alcohol tests, and they do not, uh, they're not subjected to you know, our requirements of uh, rigorous drug and alcohol testing and background, uh, they do do some background. The taxi component, the only way the federal government would allow us to do this to in ensure that we have a taxi component. So if a, a mother or a person is concerned about, you know, that aspect of it, the taxi companies essentially stand in our shoes with the type of rigorous testing and background that uh, government does. I'm going to skip this. If you have questions, we can go back to that. And last, our connection efficiency project. We are really redefining how we provide this very important service to our, our community uh, to address the rapid growth and increasing costs of Palm Tran connection. Uh, we are uh, redesigning the service. Now, um, <laughs> this is a very delicate community of riders, our elderly and disabled. This is the smaller gray vehicle. We call it a cutaway, a small, small van that transports our elderly and disabled. Um, <clears throat> and so we are uh, redesigning how we deliver that service. The costs are through the roof. <laughs> it's a service right now that is really not sustainable into the future if we continue along the same trajectory uh, in terms of how we operate the service. As you can see, just with our peers, uh, and I'm very familiar with this because I've served at the leadership level at three of these transit agencies. And um, the proportion of paratransit uh, uh, budget uh, to the, you know, para, to the fixed route budget is just enormous. And, and uh, we're at 33%. You can see some of our peers are well below 20%. So we're spending too much money on this service. Um, and we, so we're redesigning that. Uh, service um, as a part of this plan. 
skip that, I'll skip that. We'll go right to the recommendations and we're at the end of the presentation. Uh, we have three recommendations that we put it forward to the board um, on this. Um, one is to align the ADA service area with FTA guidelines. Two is to launch a trans alternative transportation uh, services program using Lyft, Uber, UServe for those who are outside of the three quarter mile and to adjust the fares which have been, adjust been adjusted in 10 years. And just to give you a quick illustration of what that means is of course on the, on the left side, that's the fixed route system, the squiggly sort of magenta lines. That's the fixed route system. The middle slide is three quarter mile of the fixed route system. That's the federal requirement. That's what they are, we are required, that's only the service we're required to provide paratransit. And on the far left side is, uh, serves all Palm Beach County. Serves all Palm Beach County. And so that's what we provide today. Most transit agencies provide the middle, the, the three, service within three quarter mile. And so we are moving towards transitioning our system to the middle. And as you can see, some of the areas that are outside of the three-quarter mile are in uh, Palm Beach Gardens. And so what we're proposing is not to have a light switch approach to this, uh, to change this very important service to a very delicate group of riders in a very slow way. I would like to refer to it using a dimmer approach. You know, just slightly adjust, you know, the service over multiple years until we get to the bright light at the end of the plan. We won't talk about that. Um, the fares, we are recommending, they haven't been changed in um, 10 years. We're recommending that we go to the federal maximum of $4, which is a 14% increase. And we, we plan a very robust public outreach effort um, you know, infield, people on the ground at high ridership locations, mailers, social media, onboard audio and video announcements, uh, postings at every bus stop sign, simply explaining how the system works. And of course, we'll do mailers and municipal coordination. We hope to work with your, your team uh, and your marketing team to get the word out about these changes. We hope to implement, begin implementing the TNC a part of this in January. Um, so we're on a pretty aggressive schedule, um, and that, um, Madam Mayor, uh, concludes our presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Forbes. Does council have a question at the moment? All right, if we do have further questions as we go through the deck a little bit more in depth, will you come back again if we need you to? We would love to. All right, thank you so much for your time. All right, moving right along, I do have... Um, two comment cards that are for items not considered on the agenda tonight. The first card will be for Ms. Jasmine Taylor, and the second card will be for Lawrence Milstein. The um, conversation that Mr. Milstein will be sharing with us will be for an item on the agenda, but in, for the sake of time and how much of an agenda we have, we're gonna allow him to speak a little bit early because it's not, uh, it's the very last thing on the agenda. So if uh, Jasmine Taylor could please come up to the podium You'll have three minutes to speak. If you could state your name and your address, please. Jasmine Taylor, my address is 3594 Florida Boulevard. Good evening, I am a senior student at William T. Dwyer High School. I am the executive officer of the JROTC program as well as the executive officer of the Black Student Union. I would like to start off by thanking my guests I'm thanking the guests this evening, as well as the council members present. Um, and a big thank you to Ms. Mayor uh, Chelsea Reed, as well as the Vice Mayor Woods, um, for giving me the opportunity to speak here tonight. I am presenting on behalf of the DeWire High School as a student, as well as a committed member of the campus today. I would like to take this opportunity to express why the donation for the, from the city, city council would serve a great purpose and benefit to our school and the students. Dwyer High School's population of almost 25,100 students represent a very diverse student body of future leaders within our community and society. Our school is committed to providing skills, resources, and knowledge for our career pathways after high school. 
While the main focus tends to be college, there is a large part of our student population that are investing time and effort in other career opportunities, such as armed services and trade schools. These are valuable programs to promote and support as they provide the information and opportunity that students need to consider careers outside of college. The majority of on-campus clubs and programs are self-funded, meaning they receive no additional funding from the school only what is independently raised by the members. Some of the clubs and programs that are offered at DeWire are, are career-based programs that provide skills and resources for students seeking career opportunities outside of college. One of the main on-campus organizations to promote post-secondary career training is the Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps, in other words, the JROTC program. Um, the JROTC program is an independent program that receives funding only from a few sources of members fundraising throughout the year. While these funds do provide some services to our organization and members, unfortunately, these funds are very limited. Dwyer High School's JROTC program receiving this donation from City Council would provide great benefit to the program, its members, and community outreach as well. The grant funds would support the JROTC program by providing the ability to purchase necessary equipment, improving the resources ut utilized to encourage membership to the program and offer support to all of our community service outreach activities. As I close, I would like to thank you again for your time and consideration to DeWire High School's JROTC program for this donation from City Council. It was my pleasure to be here on behalf of the student body and DeWire community. Lastly, thank you, Mayor Chelsea Reed, for initiating the support of our local public schools. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Well, you, you may be seated, and I have to say we're also impressed to get up in front of this many folks. You're cool as a cucumber. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. All right, Mr. Lawrence Milstein, please. If you could come up to the podium, you'll have three minutes. If you could just kindly state your name and your address. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lawrence Milstein, 497 Capistrano Drive in Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, good evening, Mayor Reed, council members. I'm Lawrence Milstein. I'm the director of the American Jewish Committee, or AJC, Palm Beach County Regional Office. And I want to thank you on behalf of AJC for considering Resolution 67, expressing the city's support for Israel. On October 7th, 2023, more Jews were murdered than on any single day since the Holocaust. It was a modern day pogrom, but this time not in Eastern Europe or in Tsarist Russia, but in the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. The rest is really commentary but the commentary is important. It's our duty, indeed our obligation, to bear witness. The more than 1,400 Jews brutally murdered, including 30 Americans, were women, children, grandmothers, infants, Holocaust survivors, and even entire families. Those killed and kidnapped included the dis disabled as well. Over 200 hostages and more than 4,000 injured. The massacre, the slaughter, the crimes against humanity must never be forgotten. Brutalized victims were paraded in the streets amid celebrations and video recordings by their murderers. Let us constantly remind the world that such evil must be defeated, that Hamas is a vicious terrorist by Iran and engaged in a genocidal campaign, not only against Israel, but against Jews everywhere. Following our own 9-11, nobody supported Al-Qaeda. When Paris was attacked, nobody supported ISIS. Today, all people of decency and good conscience must stand with Israel and against the savagery of Hamas. There is no moral equivalence. Israel wants nothing more than peace, but she cannot allow her mothers and children to be slaughtered. Above all, I hope we can all pray for the safety of all innocent lives, for the comfort of the mourners, for the healing of the wounded, for the safe return of the hostages. On behalf of AJC again, I thank Palm Beach Gardens, the city of Palm Beach Gardens for your moral clarity and for your consideration of this resolution. 
and we thank you for standing with the State of Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Milstein. Um, do we have a city manager report tonight, Ron? In the interest of time, I will forego the manager report. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, and I'll just very briefly uh, recognize our staff tonight and our council wearing teal. We're wearing teal in support of the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. So thank you all so much for raising Alzheimer's awareness and our city hall. As you leave, you'll see it is also lit up in teal. So we'll move on from here to our consent agenda. Do we have anything that will be pulled from the agenda this evening, my council? No, ma'am? No, sir? All right. So nothing has been pulled from consent agenda. May I please get a motion and a second to approve our consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve. All right. Marcy and Carl? All right. Great. Is this working? Okay. Uh, yep. Yes, sir. Yeah, All right. Sorry. Motion passes unanimously with for our consent agenda. We're going to be moving in to our public hearings now. And so I know we have a, a larger group than normal. So if you'll bear with us, we just want to... Uh, share some information as we go. So the first thing that we do is we read a quasi-judicial statement, and so I'll be doing that now. Tonight we're holding a quasi-judicial hearings on the following cases. Ordinance 2023 at first reading, a request for annexation of approximately 1,193.58 acres. Ordinance 21, 2023, at first reading, request for annexation of approximately 20.27 acres. Um, Ordinance 22 of 2023, first reading, request for annexation of approximately 31.25 acres. Ordinance 23, 2023, first reading, request for annexation of approximately 32.92 acres. Ordinance 24, 2023, first reading, request for annexation for approximately 38.71 acres. Ordinance 19, 2023, second reading, and adoption of a city-initiated petition to rezone 13.45 acres. And Ordinance 26, 2023, at first reading, City Initiated Planned Unit Development, or PUD, rezoning. This means that the City Council is required by law to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official City file on this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The Council is also required by law to cross-examine any of the witnesses who testified tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentation and will be permitted in the order of the witness's appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan on testifying this evening to do your three minutes, or wish to offer written comments, please make sure you have filled out a card and please make sure that our city clerk, city clerk over here has received it. Anyone who intends to give testimony tonight, the city clerk will now swear in all who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of the cases. So if you filled out a card, please stand up. If you are going to be speaking tonight for three minutes, which you're allowed to do for public comment regarding annexation or anything on our agenda, please stand up so you can be sworn in. You may not do public comment unless you have been sworn in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you so much, Patty. All right, so we're going to move right into our public hearings. Again, these are quasi-judicial. Tonight, Ordinance 20, Ordinance 21, Ordinance 22, Ordinance 23, and Ordinance 24 will be a combined presentation. Since these are all quasi-judicial, we're going to declare ex parte here up at our city council right now. So I'm going to go ahead and open the hearing, and then we'll go through ex parte. Do we have ex parte from Marcy? Besides the um, emails that I have received, I um, spoke to Mr. Peter Banting. All right. Thank you so much. Bert? Outside of the emails from the residents, no. Dana? Just the emails. Thank you. Thank you. Carl? Nope. All right. Thank you. I'm in the same boat, having received a few emails. So um, before we dig in, um, I know we're going to have a presentation. I just want to just talk a little bit about what to expect with parliamentary procedure. Um, I, don't, I know a lot of the folks who are here tonight may not have come to a city council meeting in the city of Palm Beach Gardens. 
and we value your opinion, we value your time, and so if you'll allow me just to read for about a minute or two, uh, it'll explain a little bit about what's gonna happen. So this is a public hearing where there's going to be a presentation, testimony, and discussion. Above all, mutual respect and consideration is expected. This meeting is important to all of us here and is going to be conducted with complete respect and decorum. So to ensure that we meet these expectations tonight, here are just a couple of basic ground rules so you understand. This chamber functions most effectively and efficiently by following rules of decorum with respectful and professional tone and conduct towards us all. If you plan to co um, comment publicly, please assure again that you have been sworn in. I will ask you as you come up as well, Please state your full name and your address for the record, and we do ask that you make your comments within three minutes. Keep in mind that's about 150 words, so if you've written out what you're hoping to say, you may want to just take a quick peek, and 150 words is about three minutes. So when you address your comments, we ask that you address the presiding officer, which, which is me, and not to in individually call anyone out, um, whether it's council, staff, or other members of the public. We ask you to please be courteous, to please be respectful and please allow others to complete their comments without interruption, noises, gestures. We're also asking you to please not clap, cajole, or ridicule any speaker, whether they are the council, our staff, or a representation from the public. So let's use common courtesy tonight. Any actions that disrupt this orderly conduct of our meeting out of accordance with basic principles of decorum may be ruled out of order and will result in immediately being removed from these proceedings. So we try to cultivate and protect an atmosphere where members of our council and our public can attend to municipal business openly, fairly, and respectfully with full participation. So please know one last thing as far as comment cards. If you're hoping to speak, your comment card must be turned in before the clerk reads it. So if you're coming for Ordinance 20, you need to turn it in before the clerk reads it so that we can make sure that it is all set and ready to go and that your comments are included. And with that, we'll start with our presentation. We have uh, our planning manager, Martin Fitz. Thank you so much. Oh, I need to read it. Okay. All right, Patty, I'm sorry. Will you read the title? A lot of talking. Ordinance 20, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, annexing a contiguous and compact area of unincorporated real property comprising a total of 1,193.58 acres, more or less, which includes, but is not limited to, the communities of Cabana Colony, Crystal Point, Hidden Key, Frenchman's Landing, Pleasant Ridge, Captain's Key, Mariner's Cove, and the main new subdivision. In accordance with Section 171.0413 Florida Statutes, such parcels being generally located north of PGA Boulevard, east of alternate A1A, west of Little Lake Worth and south of Donald Ross Road, as more particularly described herein and as depicted on the map attached here too. Amending Article 2 of the City Charter to redefine the corporate limits pursuant to involuntary annexation, calling a referendum on the question of annexation for the registered electors within the property proposed for annexation, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of State Florida Governor's Office and Palm Beach County, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you, Patty. All right, I've already opened the hearing. We've done our ex parte, so we will go ahead and have Martin Fitz, our planning manager, give us our presentation. Good evening, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. For the record, my name is Martin Fitz, planning manager, and I have been sworn in. Tonight, I will be pr providing a combined presentation for ordinances 20 through 24, which <clears throat> are city-initiated petitions to place annexation referendums on the ballot for five areas in order to allow residents the opportunity to vote on whether they would like to annex into the city or not. I'd like to briefly go over the statutory requirements for annexation. Annexation is governed by Chapter 171 of the Florida Statutes, which establishes the character of the areas that need to be annexed or proposed to be annexed. It establishes the process for a referendum annexation and establishes the public notice requirements for annexation. Each area proposed to be annexed must be contiguous, compact, and not located within another municipality at the time that the annexation proceeding begins. Contiguous basically means that a substantial part of the boundary of the area that's proposed to be annexed 
must share a boundary with the annexing municipality. Compact is defined in the Florida statutes as a concentration of property in a single area that does not create an enclave or a pocket of unincorporated land or a finger in, or serpentine pattern. Now, what's an enclave? Florida statutes further defines an enclave as an unincorporated area that is enclosed within and bounded completely on all sides by a single municipality. So basically, you would surround the entire area. Or any area of, that is enclosed within and bounded by a single municipality and a natural or man-made obstacle that prevents vehicular access except through the municipality. Here I have some examples of what an enclave is. On the left, we have uh, Area 5, uh, which is completely surrounded by the city of Palm Beach Gardens. This, on the right, we have an example of the second option. In which, this case, the city of Palm Beach Gardens has the west and south borders, and on the east and north is a body of water preventing vehicular access except through the uh, city of Palm Beach Gardens. The Florida statutes uh, indicates uh, enclaves as creating significant problems in the planning and growth management and provision of public services for municipalities. And as such, Florida statutes specifically declares that it is the policy of the state to eliminate enclaves. As such, when the city was, dis was deciding on the areas for the annexation, we included multiple enclaves in order to be consistent with Florida statutes. Second, we have a pocket of unincorporated land. And a pocket of unincorporated land is an area that's completely enclosed within or bounded on all sides by two or more municipalities. We have an example of the M&K daycare, which is located in area four. As you can see, it's completely surrounded by either Palm Beach Gardens or North Palm Beach. And lastly, we, the city cannot annex to create a finger or serpentine pattern. Essentially, this is when a uh, municipality would go down a right of way or a road uh, in order to get a specific parcel. In addition to being contiguous and compact, the area that's proposed to be annexed must be developed for urban purposes. The Florida Statutes, uh, Chapter 171, specifies a number of ways in which this can be, uh, can be justified. Uh, the primary reason or primary way is subse subsection A, uh, which is highlighted the total resident population equal to at least two persons per each acre of land. As part of the, the um, process for an, a referendum annexation, the city is required to provide or prepare an annexation feasibility study. In the study, the, <clears throat> it provides documentation for how each area meets all the criteria for annexation. Also, it reviews all of the uh, current status of, of public services within the proposed annexation area, such as police, fire, parks and recreation, and identifies what is required to provide the same level of service to the annexation areas as is provided to the current city. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also to determine what, uh, whether or not the annexation would be feasible for the city. Tonight, we're proposing uh, to annex five areas into the city, uh, as indicated on the map in the five colors and numbered one through five. The proposed annexation areas will remove gaps in the city's boundary and extend the city's boundary to natural stopping points, such as the intercoastal waterway and the neighboring municipal boundaries. Because the five areas are not uh, part, all part of one area, we have to include have five separate annexation areas, five separate ordinances, and five separate referendums. I would note that each, for each referendum, the votes within that area apply only to that area and do not impact any other. So votes in area one do not impact area four and vice versa. A brief summary of the areas that we're proposing to annex, um, a total of about 3,500 parcels uh, with just under 4,000 dwelling units equating to 8,300 potential residents for the city, also a total of about 1,300 acres. The areas are developed primarily as single-family and multifamily residential with some commercial along US-1 and alternate A1A. There is also limited public and industrial uh, uses within the area. 
Now I'll, I'll go over each area and provide a little bit more detail and also provide a summary of the results of the annexation feasibility study for each area. Area 1 is shown on the map. It's generally bounded by alternate A1A on the west, Donald Ross Road on the north, Little Lake Worth and the Intercoastal Waterway on the east, and PGA Boulevard on the south. It composes uh, just under 1,200 acres, 3,600 dwelling units, and approximately 7,600 residents. It is primarily built out with single-family and multifamily residential, along with the commercial, along alternate A1A and US-1. There are also institutional uses. There are two churches, one school, two parks, and conservation land owned by Palm Beach County. The land uses uh, range from the primarily low-density residential and medium-density residential, uh, typified by Cabana Colony, Ple Pleasant Ridge, Hidden Key, and Captain's Key, as well as the commercial along US-1 and alternate A1A, and some high-density residential along with uh, Eisenhower Elementary and uh, Industrial at Seminole Marine. The zoning for the area um, is also primarily multifamily, medium density, and single family residential, as well as the general commercial and high density residential. Area 1 meets the statutory requirements for annexation by being contiguous and compact, as well as having a density of 6.43 persons per acre. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to go over the level of service analysis. I will be doing this for each of the areas, so there will be some repetition, but I will go into a little bit more detail for the first, just to uh, provide some background. The, all of the areas are within the Seacoast Utility Authority service area. For area one, the central water is provided or available for all of the proposed areas through Seacoast or private systems. For sanitary sewer, again, the majority of the area has sanitary sewer provided through Seacoast or private systems. There are some neighborhoods within Area 1 that currently are serviced with private septic tanks, and these will be able to continue as permitted through the Florida Department of Health. There are, however, central lines that are in the vicinity of each of these communities should they choose to connect in the future. The city has established a parks and recreation level of service of five acres per 1,000 residents. The city currently has approximately 569 acres of park space throughout the city's boundaries. Area 1 has a projected population of 66,582 residents uh, when we add the uh, existing population of 59,000. This would require park space of 332 acres. The city has sufficient park space to meet the level of service, so no additional park space is required. Neighborhood services is uh, sometimes referred to as the code compliance, but we <clears throat> the area is, because of the size of the area, they will need to add some additional personnel, vehicles, and equipment, and the anticipated uh, cost of $400,000. The police has established a level of service based on calls for service, and generally it equates to two officers per 1,000 residents. Based on the projected population, this would require adding 18 new police officers, as well as vehicles and equipment. The anticipated first year cost would be uh, just over $3 million. However, due to the upfront cost of vehicles and equipment, the subsequent year's uh, costs are anticipated to be reduced. For fire rescue, uh, the city participates in an automatic aid agreement with, the, uh, with North Palm Beach and the Palm Beach County to provide uh, fire service for all of the for our adjoining areas. The areas to the west of the Intercoastal Waterway are within Palm Beach Garden service area and our, the fire stations are first call for those uh, areas. For the areas to the east uh, of the Intercoastal Waterway, Palm Beach Gardens does already serve these areas through the automatic aid agreement. This automatic aid agreement is anticipated to continue and therefore no no additional costs are anticipated for fire rescue at this time. The city's public services department maintains the roads and sidewalks, so street sweeping, stormwater, and canal maintenance. The anticipated first year cost would be $276,000. We'll note that the, it is anticipated that up to 17 acres of canal right of way will be transferred to the city at some point. At that time, the cost to uh, to improve and maintain those canals would be added to the city's work program. 
The city pays for the solid waste pickup for the residents within the city due to the increase of residential units within the annexation area. There's an anticipated cost of $537,000. General government services are primarily the personnel for um, administration, finance, IT, and the like. But there, is an, there will be an additional cost from the clerk's office to be able to provide additional polling locations for future elections, yielding an anticipated cost of $268,000. We have a summary of the, first, of the cost of providing services for the area. It's approximately $6.5 million. Estimated revenues for the first year are, are sourced from ad valorem taxes, franchise fees, and the communication service tax, as well as the gas tax, which is used to pay for roads. The estimated first year revenue would be $8.6 million, yielding a net benefit of $2.1 million for area one. Area two, <clears throat> excuse me, is located uh, on the west side of Ellison Wilson Road and east of the Intercoastal Waterway, north of McLaren Road. It's approximately 20.27 acres, 74 dwelling units, and 157 residents. It is um, completely single-family or multifamily residential. There's a future land use of high-density residential south of the city's flag lot and low-density residential north of the flag lot. And zoning is medium-density multifamily residential for all parcels. Area 2 meets the statutory requirements for annexation by being contiguous and compact, as well as having a density of 7.74 residents or persons per acre. The, <clears throat> the water and sewer are provided or available uh, for the proposed annexation area through Seacoast Utility Authority. No additional personnel, vehicles, or equipment are anticipated for neighborhood services, parks and recreation, or the police department. Likewise, fire rescue, no additional costs are anticipated. There would be an increase of $4,000 for the uh, additional solid waste pickup for the residential uh, units in the area. However, no additional costs are anticipated for public services or general government, yielding an anticipated first year cost of $4,000. Anticipated revenues are $195,000, yielding $191,000 benefit. Annexation Area 3 is generally known as, as Pirate Cove. It's located south of PGA Boulevard, uh, east of the Prosperity Farms Road, and west of the Intercoastal Waterway. It consists of 31.25 acres, 63 dwelling units, and 134 residents. It's generally built out as single-family residential. All the parcels have a low-density residential, three units per acre, land use, and a single-family residential zoning. Area 3 meets the statutory requirements, uh, both by being compact and contiguous, and having 4.29 residents per acre. Again, the area is in the Seacoast Utility Authority area for water and sewer, and water, central water is provided, water and sewer are provided or available for all, all units within the, the annexation area. No additional personnel, vehicles, or equipment are anticipated for neighborhood services, parks and recreation, police, for, or the fire rescue, as well as public services and general government. However, there would be an increase, I apologize, public services would be an increase of $12,000, and solid waste would have an anticipated cost of $9,000, yielding a total anticipated first year cost of $21,000. Estimated first year revenues would be $316,000, with a net anticipated benefit of $295,000. Annexation area four, consists of the communities of Monet Acres and Monet Heights, as well as the Columbian Building Association uh, Hall and the MNK Daycare. It's generally located on the northeast or northwest corner of RCA Boulevard and Prosperity Farms Road, except for the one parcel on the east side of Prosperity Farms Road. 32.92 acres with 71 dwelling units and 151 residents. It is a single fam primarily single-family and mobile home residential and a place of assembly and daycare use. The future land use is primarily uh, low-density residential uh, for three and one unit per acre, as well as a high-density residential for Monet Acres. 
The zoning is single family residential and multifamily residential high density. This area meets the statutory requirements for, uh, for annexation by being uh, contiguous and compact, and it has a density of 4.93 persons per acre. The area is within the Seacoast Utility Authority service area. However, Monet Acres does have a private water system and lift station in place. Uh, Monet Heights is serviced by individual wells and septic tanks, and they may continue to utilize these systems in, as consistent with the Florida Department of Health requirements. However, water mains and sewer mains are located along RCA Boulevard and Prosperity Farms Road should they choose to connect in the future. No, there's no anticipated, um, no need for additional parks and recreation, and no additional personnel, vehicles, or equipment for neighborhood services, police, fire rescue, or general services, general government services. Public services would anticipate the uh, increase of $8,000, and solid waste would increase by $12,000 due to the residential units. It's an estimated first year cost of $20,000, estimated first year revenue of $101,000, yielding a net benefit of $81,000. Annexation area five is Monet Gardens. This is an existing enclave, currently on the north side of RCA Boulevard, south of Fairchild. They consist of 38.71 acres, 113 dwelling units, approximately 240 residents. It's almost completely built out as single family residential. All the parcels have a low density residential, two units per acre uh, land use, and a single family residential zoning. This area meets the statutory requirements for annexation as well. It is a, as an enclave, it is contiguous and compact, and it has a density of 6.2 persons per acre. Again, this area is within the Seacoast Utility Authority service area. However, uh, Monet Gardens is serviced by private wells and individual septic tanks, and they may continue to do so. Water mains and sanitary sewer are located uh, adjacent to the community and is available to connect should they choose to in the future. No additional park space is required uh, for the population. The, there is also no additional personnel, vehicles, or equipment anticipated for neighborhood services, police, or fire. Public services anticipates um, a cost of $12,000, and the solid waste would be $10,000 due to the residences. The general government anticipates no additional personnel or equipment. The first year estimated cost would be $22,000. Estimated first year revenues of $116,000, with a net benefit of $94,000. To summarize, I just want to point, summarize again that each of the areas meets the criteria for Chapter 171, Florida Statutes. Area 1 is contiguous on three sides and is compact per the definition in the Florida Statutes. Area 2 is contiguous on the north and portions of the east. Area 3 is contiguous on the northwest and most of the east as well. Area 4 is an existing enclave and a pocket of unincorporated land. And Area 5 is an existing enclave. Each of the areas meets the, the definition as developed for urban purposes by having populations of greater than two per acre. <clears throat> for the referendum process per Florida statutes, the city prepared an annexation feasibility studies for each area. This feasibility study was filed with the Palm Beach County Board of County Commissioners no fewer than 15 days before the commencing annexation procedures on October 17th. Mailers were sent to all the residents and property owners in the area no less than 10 days prior to the hearing. And they were mailed on October 19th, 2023. Uh, we have two hearings on the ordinances. Tonight is first reading. The second reading will be on December 6th. If the ordinance is passed, the referendum will be held for each annexation area on March 19th of 2024. I would note that in the, in the annexation referendum, only the registered voters in the area would vote on the annexation and a simple majority of the votes cast will decide the results of the annexation referendum. Following annexation, should they pass, the annexations will become effective October 1st, 2024, which coincides with the city's new budget year and new fiscal year. The city will assign a comparable land use and zoning for all the parcels. Until such time as the city assigns a, a, a new land use and zoning, the county codes will remain in effect. The city will, will also survey all the roads, canals, sidewalks, and drainage to 
the city which may be incorporated into the city's work program. The city has conducted <coughs> community outreach, uh, such as the public information meeting that was held last week. We have, have had several meetings with property owners associations and neighborhood associations, and we are continuing to set up those meetings. Uh, the staff has, provided, has had staff visits and has provided mailers to the property owners and residents, as well as ads in the Palm Beach Post. Palm Be this area is not located within the Palm Beach County Unincorporated Protection Area, and the Board of County Commissioners' action is not required for an involuntary annexation. Public notice has been met through the mailers and also through ads running the Palm Beach Post, and the staff recommends approval. Thank you so much, Martin. Okay, so again, just to reiterate, we did present Ordinance 20, Ordinance 21, Ordinance 22, Ordinance 23, and Ordinance 24 as a combined presentation. Um, so even though uh, we did that, the clerk will be reading each ordinance out. So again, if you intend to put a comment card in for the remaining ordinances, Ordinance 21, 22, 23, or 24, now is the time to do so. And I will call that out ahead each time so that everyone can come up and give a comment card. I do have comment cards on this item tonight. So I'm going to call out the names of the folks who have submitted comment cards for this first ordinance, for Ordinance 20. Again, you're going to have three minutes to speak. We'll bring you up to the podium. We're going to ask you to state your name and your address. We will ask again if you've been sworn in or if you'd like to say, my name is so-and-so, I live at so-and-so, and yes, I have been sworn in, then we won't ask you. So just make sure that you let us know that you have been sworn in. Um, and uh, so I'll be calling the first name and then the second name thereafter so the next person can be ready to read. So the first person is going to be Charles Hollings, and then after Mr. Hollings, it'll be John Shea, and I apologize ahead of time for any names that I may not get right tonight. Again, if we could keep the comments, applause, and everything to zero, that would be lovely. Thank you. Good evening, sir. You'll have Good three evening. minutes. Charles Hollings, 1679 Pleasant Drive, North Palm Beach, and I have been sworn in. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Council. It's great to be with you. At your informational meeting last week, I had the opportunity to speak to Deputy City Manager Lori Laveria. And referring to this mailer that I received a couple weeks ago, I pointed out that it says annexation isn't something that's done to you. Annexation is done something by you. So I asked her if I were to present a petition bearing the signatures of 50% plus one of our residents opposed to annexation, would she remove Pleasant Ridge from annexation zone one? Her reply was basically, no, it's too late for that. Consequently, if annexation is approved in zone one, it's going to happen to us in Pleasant Ridge. I then shared a Palm Beach Post article with Lori that appeared in the, pa in, uh, in the paper on October 3rd. The article quotes Palm Beach Gardens officials as saying, the move to annex that land is part of a larger strategy to provide more control over development and redevelopment in those areas. In that same article, Lori is quoted as saying, a feasibility study is underway now to examine resources which might be needed to bring those areas up to a higher standard. But then Lori told the Post that Quote, it's not the intent of the city to disrupt or change any of the proposed annexation communities. We value and respect the unique character of each neighborhood. Well, I'm confused. Which is a council? Control development and redevelopment, bring areas up to a higher standard, or not disrupt or change any of the annexation communities and respect the unique character of each neighborhood? Because you can't do both. In reference to Juno Beach's voluntary annexation in pursuit of Captain's Key, Palm Beach Gardens Mayor Chelsea Reed is quoted in this morning's Palm Beach Post as saying, quote, we look forward to continuing to be good neighbors. In closing, I must say, Palm Beach Garden has not, not been a good neighbor to Pleasant Ridge. You never asked us if we wanted to be annexed. I'm here to tell you that we don't, and you must vote no. Thank you for listening. I look forward to being with you next month. Thank you, sir. Wait, no, no. If there are applause after speaking or boos, if anyone is speaking, whether they're for or against or otherwise, you will be removed and you will not have the opportunity to speak. Please do not do that again. We want this to be respectful and timely. 
we have probably a couple hours of this. All right, so let's make sure that you guys allow everyone their three minutes, and I don't need to touch that gavel again. Next up, we're going to have John Shea, and then after that, Nicholas uh, Geisler. Geisler. Come up. I'm going to have to start the, the again, clock take right your now, time. so we got a little troubleshooting here. And while we're waiting, if everyone could please silence your cell phones. We have a couple phones going off as well, and that'll allow the people providing public comment to not be interrupted. All right, thank you guys so much. Again, it's uh, John Shea and then Nicholas Geisler afterwards. You'll have three minutes, sir. Is he here? John Shea, S-H-E-A. All right, let's move along. Nicholas Geisler is next, and then after Nicholas Geisler is Holly Finch. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Nicholas Geisler, attorney with Bartlett Loeb, Hines, Thompson, and Angelos, uh, representing residents of Hidden Key, address 819 South Federal Highway, Stewart, and I've been sworn in. As a preliminary matter, we were uh, advised by the city attorney that we would not be granted intervener status into tonight's hearing. Um, so we have prepared, the residents have prepared a written statement that I have mailed, uh, emailed to each of you and also sent to the city clerk, but I'd like to formally introduce it to be part of the record tonight. Who wrote it? Um, it, it was written on behalf of the residents of Hidden Key. By whom? Well, by a group of people, but I'm submitting it tonight as their attorney. So are you taking ownership of the document? Yes. Okay, so it's as if it's being written by you. Correct. Okay, fine. We'll accept it. Okay. Should I step? Yes, sir. That's fine. You can approach the clerk. Absolutely. Can we pause this timer? Are we able to do that? Thank you. We'll give you a couple extra seconds. I, I appreciate that, Madam Mayor. And we do ask that the uh, council reconsider its position on um, intervention of affected parties should this ordinance be passed tonight and a second reading um, happen again in December. Um, notwithstanding that, we, I do represent Hidden Key, and as outlined in the written statement, we feel that the passage of this ordinance is improper, both uh, for reasons of governance and for reasons of legality. Um, if you look at the city's own feasibility study, if you turn to page 11, there is a certification that the area, and we're talking about zone one, is reasonably compact. And that certification is required by Florida law, and it is present in your study. But if you flip a few pages back, on page three, you'll look at all the areas that are included in zone one. And as the city's presentation has already mentioned, the definition of compact includes a statement that it must be a single area. Well, on page three, it lists all the areas, plural, that are part of zone one. This includes Cabana Colony, Frenchman's Landing, Crystal Point, it goes on and on. I can't say them all because there's over 40 of them. So the question is, how can this be a single area when your own feasibility study says it's over 40 areas? Moving down on that page, it goes through the existing land use and the future land use and zoning of these 40 communities. It can't even fit on the page, so you have to create an entire appendix at the back of your feasibility study. If you turn to that page of the appendix, it goes through all the different zoning categories, general commercial, residential transition, transitional, single-family residential, light, industrial. It goes on and on. It takes up multiple lines of two pages of the appendix. So in short, we don't feel that this annexation is proper. We think it violates Florida law. And uh, despite what happens tonight, the residents of Hidden Key don't intend to let it happen. All thank right. you. Thank you, sir. All right. After, no, thank you. Please, no. After, uh, we've got Holly Finch, and then um, following Ms. Finch will be Barry, P-A, I think it's a V, A-I-Z-O. So, Ms. Finch and then Barry. 
Hello, my name is Holly Finch. I also live in Hidden Key. My address is 11639 Landing Place, and I have been sworn in, and I would like to turn my time over back to our attorney if he's interested in finishing his comment. Okay. I just wanted to also point out, really reiterate his point, that when you talked about the types of uh, of enclaves, they had to be continuous and compact. And I noticed, even in your own ordinances, the difference and in the presentation of the size of the different zones. And our zone is much larger, lots, to, in fact, um, 12 times larger than the next largest zone and um, 32 times larger than their, than the, I'm sorry, 32 times larger than the next zone and seven, 12 times larger than all the other zones. So the, the issue that my residents in Hidden Key have, and it is unanimous, unanimous that that petition's been signed, those documents that were presented to you, we don't have one person who is for this annexation because that zone was unfairly put together. And I also know this from personal experience, having lived in Hidden Key since 2000, that I personally had a small traffic accident in front of our gate and I sat there while the sheriff's department and Palm Beach Gardens police argued about who would take care of me at the front of Hidden Key because it is not continuous. We actually abut up to North Palm Beach. If you come around MacArthur Park and you are speeding and I unfortunately know this from a child of mine, you will be pulled over by the North Palm Beach police. So we are not surrounded by Palm Beach Gardens. We don't want to be annexed by Palm Beach, Palm Beach Gardens. I don't happen to live on the water. My property backs up to Oak Brook Plaza. There are numerous complaints and problems with that commercial district, and I don't see your police responding. And even to show up tonight, I have to point out that I had to cross a bridge that was up, and I had to cross Brightline, a railroad track. So when you talk about your services, your police, and your fire, if anyone in our, in our neighborhood has a fire or a medical issue, it is not going to be easily accessible by Palm Beach Gardens' current facilities. And I don't know if you're planning on building more with all the money you're going to be taxing from us, but it just was not communicated well to our community. We all learned about it in the Palm Beach Post and in that newspaper article on October 3rd. We sent a steering committee over to talk to the council and the mayor, and I want everyone to know they want us to value and respect them, and that's a nice comment, but the reality is all of our concerns were ignored. We've been brushed off and put aside, and that is why all the residents of Hidden Key have chipped in for, for uh, legal assistance, and this isn't the end of that. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, so we've got Barry, P-A-V-A-I-Z-U. And then after Barry, we have Melissa, W-E-I-G-A-N-D, Weigand. Come on up, sir. I'd just like to say a few things here. First of all, we have Northern Water I'm Management sorry, sir. District. You have to, wait, sir, you need to state your name for the record and your address and that you were sworn in, please. Okay, it's Barry Paraiso, 11758 Lakeshore Place, North Palm. Okay? And you were, sworn were you sworn in, in sir? Did Pardon you, me? Did you lift up your hand and when our clerk oh, swore? Okay. We'll swear you in real quick. Okay. All right. Before she does, if there's anybody else that has submitted a card, if you were not sworn in, would you please stand and raise your right hand at this time so you can be sworn in? Being none, thank you. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we have Northern Water Management District. They take care of everything. They own our gates. They, they take care of the sidewalks. They take care of the roads. We, we don't need anybody to do all that stuff. Um, we, we've been doing that for a long, long time. Uh, they work very well for us. We've talked to them about it, and uh, they don't really even understand what's going on with you guys doing this. So I just wanted to sort of evaluate and just explain to you that this is not anything that we want. Okay, thank you so much for your time. All right, next we have Melissa Weigand and then Charles Collins. And then, again, if you're the second person, please get ready to jump right up because uh, it'll be three minutes or less, so you're welcome to stand nearby or or be close by. So again, we've got Melissa. If you could state your name, your address, and if you've been sworn in. Sure, Melissa Wiegand, 2059 Pleasant Drive, and I have been sworn in, thank you. Um, 
I actually also have um, declaration of opposition forms. I will take ownership of these forms. I would like them submitted for the record. They are from um, the majority of them from area one. However, residents from the other areas to be annexed uh, involuntarily got access to it and also filled them out. So I would like this added to the, um, to the record as well. And, and what are they, ma'am? They are uh, declaration of opposition to um, involuntary annexation. So they have um, the residents' names, they have renters' names, they have um, taxpayers' names, uh, multiple landowners' names, um, addresses, signatures, and that quite a few of them have been notarized as well. So... Um, well, if you want to submit it to the clerk, we will, but just for yes. the record, the submission of those petitions do not establish standing for those individuals in any way, shape, or form. That's fine. As long as it's added to the record, that's all we ask at this point. Um, my name is Melissa... submit it to the clerk. Please. Can you stop the clock and then submit it to the clerk? I am addressing you in opposition to the involuntary annex annexation, and clearly I represent a large number of unincorporated Palm Beach County residents, also in opposition for a multitude of reasons. In just one week's time, I have collected over 150 forms from multiple areas um, that we want added to the record, um, again, please, and that is from the east and west side of the uh, proposed annexation areas. On the east side of the intercoastal, as mentioned earlier, we do not have equal voting rights as the newly created Area 1 has over 50% of the voter population on the west side of the intercoastal. We have excellent representation of urban services, as you call them, through our current providers of Palm Beach County Fire and Rescue and the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. The Sheriff's Office has rarely taken 10 minutes to respond um, and arrive at my house after being contacted. Due to our geographic location on the east side of the intercoastal, we are surrounded by bridges, and the closest Palm Beach Garden Station is physically four, minute, four miles or 11 minutes away from my specific address. With an added 10 minutes plus for bridge openings, this is a minimum of 21 minutes response time. 21 minutes um, when a dwelling is on fire, a citizen is in cardiac arrest, or when someone is being held at gunpoint is a huge liability and the difference between life and death. Um, we realize, the Area 1 residents realize, that there are um, over 2.1 million reasons for Palm Beach Gardens to attempt um, this annexation, this, which is basically a residential land grab. Um, but my points are only a sampling of the plethora of reasons this annexation will not benefit residents, voters, taxpayers in the proposed areas. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Next, we have Charles Collins. After Charles Collins, uh, Shauna Walker. After Shauna Walker, we're going to have Arye Sahayek. So again, Mr. Collins, Shauna Walker, Sahayek. Good evening. Thank you very much. Charles Collins, uh, 11916 Lakeshore Place, Hidden Key. Um, as you've heard, Hidden Key has been forced to retain counsel, uh, who you've already heard from tonight and who are continuing the fight against this annexation. Excuse me, sir, have you been sworn in? I have been sworn in. Thank you. Continuing on, uh, as you've also heard, uh, not one resident in Hidden Key is in favor of this annexation. To us, this is a land grab and a tax revenue grab. Hidden, Gree, Hidden Key represents only 3% of Zone 1 households, but represents 25% of Zone 1 revenue that you will be generating from this annexation. And it's in this context that I wanted to add some color to our attorney's arguments, which, you have, which have been set out in writing. Many of the residents have lived in Hidden Key for more than 15 years. Many of our residents are retired and living on a fixed income. For some of us, this annexation will effectively tax us out of our own homes, paying as much as an additional $250,000 to gardens over the next 10 years. So you see, it doesn't matter to many of us whether the services of gardens are superior to what we have currently, because many of us will not be living in hidden key as a result of this annexation. And to that end, I wonder if the human element to this annexation was part of your calculus. I wonder how each of you would feel if you were on the receiving end of this annexation. I doubt very much that it was part of your calculation. Your marketing materials, as you've heard from others before me, say, in writing, 
annexation isn't something that is done to you. You go on to say annexation can only be done by you. You continue by saying it is your choice. We are unanimous in not wanting to be part of this annexation. Be true to your words. The choice should be ours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please, please don't, I, I will not, I would love everyone to have the opportunity to speak. Let's allow that. So let's let Ms. Walker speak. She'll have three minutes. If you could state your name, address, and if you've been sworn in. After that will be Mr. Sahayek. And then after that is Joseph uh, something Angelo. So, yeah. Thank you, Council. Shana Walker, 3842 Dunes Road, Palm Beach Gardens, and I have been sworn in. Just a couple of really quick comments. I am here as a representative from Cabana Colony, and overwhelmingly, our 740 homes do not wish for this annexation. They are hardworking people that can't afford the increase in taxes and the utility and communications benefits that you have estimated do not apply to the multitude of our homeowners. So the cost savings is not a cost savings to us at all. We have already seen that there are $2 million in profit just from area one. Um, that is disturbing to most of our homeowners. So we, again, do not support this annexation. We have 740 homes and we will be out there on uh, corners with signs and anything that we can do to sway any of these surrounding communities that we do not want this in Palm Beach Gardens. Thank you. We'll move on to, I think it might be Dr. Sahayek or is it Mr. Sahayek, I apologize. Ari Sahayek. Ari, okay. Ari Sahayek, I have been sworn in. Uh, I'd like to go on record. I represent... Uh, Excuse me, sir. Name, address, and... and yes. Ari A. Sahayek. I'm here on behalf of commercial property owner... Uh, the address is... 12300 Alternate A1A on the corner of uh, Alternate A1A and Florida Boulevard. Um, I'd like to first of all state that the... Um, uh, as a commercial property owner, I feel that my um, property rights have been violated because we truly don't get to vote. Uh, we own property in, in Zone 1, and um, it's my understanding that we do not have a chance to vote on this issue. And I do feel like we're being impacted because from a commercial property perspective, we are currently entitled under our current zoning district to certain retail uses, commercial property uses. And if this annexation goes forward, there's no information whatsoever about how those uses are gonna be impacted down the line. Certain businesses may not be able to operate. Should those businesses sh shut down, are we gonna have some sort of non-conforming issues, conforming issues? Then, are, then we're gonna be subject to all the new code enforcement, inspections that have to go on. And um, uh, there's a lot on the line for us as commercial property owners. I feel like it's a violation of property rights, as I said before, and unconstitutional. And as the commercial property owner there, even though I don't have a vote, I vote uh, no on record. And, um, um, yeah, I'd like to just say that. Thank right, you. Thank you for your time. All right, we have uh, Joseph, I think it's V. D. Angelo, and then Christopher Wingate after that. And looks like Desmond Mayers after, but I will get my glasses out to read that one again. So could, is Mr. Angelo here or D. Angelo here? No? Oh, okay, sir, we'll get to your card. So we've got Mr. Christopher Wingate. And afterwards, it is Desmond John Mayers. Good afternoon, or evening, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Christopher Wingate. I also live on Dunes Road at 3773. Three, three, three. I am sworn in. I'm looking at the map on Zone 1, and I kind of see that Cabana Colonies is about 30%, about or maybe 33% of Zone 1. I can't predict the vote, if it would be yes or no, but I can predict that the Cabana Colony residents would be at a two-thirds disadvantage, whether the vote is yes or no. That's all I want to say. Thank you, sir, for coming so much. We've got um, Mr. Desmond John Mayers, if, and then Taylor Gibbon afterwards, and then after that, Fred Brunt. So if you all could be ready, do we have anyone else? Uh, no. That was the one who was not coming, Mr. Mayers? No? All right, Taylor Gibbon, G-I-B-B-O-N. 
All right, so after Taylor Gibbon, if Fred Brandt could please get ready. After Fred Brandt, Mike, P-R-E-Z-E, -E, I believe. All right, three minutes if you could state your name and address and if you've been sworn uh, Taylor in. Taylor Gibbon, I live at 2633 Bordeaux Court and I've been sworn in. Um, we live in Frenchman's Landing and so far the feedback that we've gotten from most of the community is not in favor of the annexation. And we do feel that there's a lot of lack of information, um, especially, you know, what would happen in the future? Will taxes be going up? What's the guarantee on that? Um, and maybe a lot, like a lack of information about what, what improvements would you guys be making in order to take on this gained population? So would you be building new fire stations and new police headquarters to be able to handle the additional population? And when would that take place? And how long would it take to go into um, effect? Um, we also feel that the perks and benefits that we would receive being an HOA and having private roads do not, are not balanced with the amount of taxes that would go up. We wouldn't be, um, we wouldn't have the privilege of getting the maintenance, the street maintenance, the storm drainage maintenance, uh, the street signs. We were told that we would get a discount if we wanted to order street signs through the city, but we'd still have to pay for them. So I just don't see what the benefit it would be for us. We already do get assistance from the fire department and from the sheriff's office. We have never had a problem with response in either of those areas. Um, and I, we also feel that it would create a hardship when we go to sell our homes. So a lot of the houses right now, well, two people I know who are in favor have bought houses years ago. So they are tax valued at a much lower amount than what they're currently selling for right now. Uh, I know the tax on my house would more than double if I were to sell it to somebody, and it doesn't seem like, you know, a perk for the next owner. Uh, yeah, we're just worried. We're not. It's not great. Thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, Ms. Givens. All right. We've got Fred Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T. After Mr. Fred Brandt, we have Mike, P-R-E, it looks like a Z-E, and then Celeste Colleton. Mr. Brandt, your name, address, and if you've been sworn in, sir. I have been sworn in. Fred Brandt, 2567 Monaco Circle, Frenchman's Landing. I'm really concerned because I'm, I'm disappointed. Uh, I might have been in favor of annexation had it been presented in a more open way. It's not until I came here and listened tonight do I realize this is being forced on me. Unless you tell me that if Zone A or Zone 1, the 20, if 51% of those people within the entire zone vote, then the entire area is annexed. Is that correct? I think it is. I can't support that at all. All right, thank you, sir. We've got Mike P R E. I think it's a Z or an S or an R and E. You can clarify when you come on up if you could uh, state your name and your address and if you've been sworn in. After Mr. After Mike, we're going to have Celeste and then Wallace Woodard. My name is Mike Priest, P-R-E-C-E. -E. I live at uh, 3603 Catalina Road in Cabana Colony. And we are completely against being annexed. We've lived in Cabana Colony, or I have, my whole life. Grew up there, bought a house there, raised a family there. I've had no problems with the government that we've had in place. We bought a house based on a tax code that we could afford in a neighborhood that had no HOAs with no problems. All of a sudden, we get told that we're being put up for a vote for annexation for all this. I mean, we've had the county come in and clean up our neighborhood. They've paved our roads. The sheriff has been very And I asked this at the church, and I'll ask it again. How is adding an additional layer of government going to make my life better? I come in here, I have to ask permission to speak. You bang a gavel when we clap for people. I just don't understand how any of this makes my life better, the life of my kids better, the life of my, my wife better, the life of my neighbors better. 
you're going to come in, you're going to give all these Palm Beach Gardens rules that we're going to have to follow on top of be already dealing with the county. And I'm just concerned that you're going to change our whole way of life for a little bit of tax revenue on your end. I just don't understand. And I'm asking again, how is my life going to be benefit from any of this? Are you done? Are you done speaking? I am. Yes. All right. Thank you, sir. We're going to move on so everyone has oh, an opportunity. You, you yeah, we, we don't. Okay. We, we all. We just listen now. So we're here to do nothing but listen, and that is why we're encouraging everyone to just come up and speak because that's what we're here to do now is listen to you. So we have Celeste, and I'm sorry. Yes, I, I could be. Colleton. Colleton. I apologize. All right, I couldn't read it. And then after that, we have Wallace Woodard and then Robin Bundy, if you could be prepared to speak. Okay, my name's Celeste Colleton. I live in Hidden Key at 11660 Landing Place, and I have been sworn in. Okay. Um, the gate at our entrance and the land on both sides up to the sidewalk are in the unincorporated Palm Beach County owned by Northern Palm Beach uh, County Improvement District. And Hidden Key shares the cost annually with them. They bill us all for the roads, for the gate maintenance, for the sidewalks, for the storm drains, for everything. Our fire rescue now is Juno, Juno Beach County. And um, if we need the sheriff, he responds. Uh, we have very little crime, we don't need him very often. Uh, my question is, if, uh, if we vote yes for annexation, what are you really offering us that we don't already have? And do you want to see the, the uh, this is how the gate is not in Palm Beach Garden. The gate is in unincorporated Palm Beach County. Okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if, yes. if you want to submit it over here to our clerk. And our lawyer will review it for submission. All right, we have Wallace Woodard, and then we have Robin Bundy. After Robin Bundy, we have Mike Love. And you'll have three minutes, name, address, and if you've been sworn in. I have been sworn in. I'm Wallace Woodard. I live at 12774 South Normandy Way in Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, I've lived there for 40 years, over 40 years. We raised our family there, and we've been very happy with the Palm Beach County services and amenities for those 40 years. I'm here to speak about two concerns I have with your proposed annexation information. The first of which is the numbers that you arrived at for the taxing purposes here and how much you would be paying. Um, although I'm not interested in paying any more taxes. Uh, I got numbers last week from your finance department that your revenues would be $9,170,000, which was close to the numbers that came up today, over 3,500 properties. And when I took that out, it was over $2,600 on average for each property. So if that's 2600 on average for each property, and supposedly people that are 400000 or less would be paying next to nothing, then largely the monies are going to be secured from the people that are, have properties worth more than that. And the second question I had was the areas selected, and that was the... My concern was, why did you pick all the areas you did? Why didn't we have single areas selected one at a time or something? Well, it has to be contiguous. It has to be compact. So then I look at the neighborhoods to the east, and I say, well, you know, you're contiguous, and, but you skipped over Seminole Landing and you skipped over Lost Tree. Why were they not included? So those were the two concerns I had. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've got Robin Bundy, and after Robin Bundy, we have Mike Love, and then, pardon me? Okay, so you're not speaking. Uh, we've got Catherine, sorry, Mike Love, and then Catherine Murray. Hi, my name is Michael Love. 
I live at 2117 <clears throat> North Palm Circle in North Palm Beach. And although I'm um, have you been sworn not, in? pardon? Have you been sworn in? I have been sworn in. Thank you, yes. sir. Uh, although not in favor of this annexation, I also have a home in Palm Beach Gardens, and it's a very nice place to be, um, don't mind saying. Uh, I'm one of the few residents <clears throat> on the east side of the Intercoastal Waterway that has no opportunity whatsoever for sewer services. Um, I just recently built a new home. Um, actually, my home is on the Intercoastal Waterway and was forced to go back with another septic tank. Um, I think the reason Seacoast has not brought septic services to our area is because it's going to be very expensive. And I would just challenge you and encourage you to please look at those numbers very closely and find out exactly how many of these residents do not have sewer service or access to sewer services because the majority of them are leaching right into the intercoastal waterway, which is problematic. And it's just a matter of time before residents and environmental groups alike get frustrated by that and put, you know, force government to do something. I can't imagine it hadn't been done yet, but uh, please take a real close look at that before you uh, decide to annex this property. How many residents don't have access to sewer? It's not a matter of we have a line that we can tap onto. There, there is no such line that we can tap onto. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have two more cards for this ordinance, for Ordinance 20. So if you plan to speak for Ordinance 21, 22, 23, or 24, please make sure you have submitted a card to the clerk. Thank you for waiting. Uh, we're going to hear from Catherine Murray and then Genevieve Duchot. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Catherine Murray, and I'm here on <clears throat> in regards to my home at 11597 Landing Place in Hidden Key. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, you just, you, were you sworn in, ma'am? That was my next comment. Oh, sorry. Okay, that thank you. A, we just try to follow the, make sure everything is officially okay, submitted. Thank you. Around. I have been sworn in. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I also thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with you tonight on this important issue. Uh, it's interesting to, to be at a public hearing when everyone is saying the same thing. I just, it just uh, is really uh, interesting that there's a little diversity in, in comments here that um, we do not wish to be annexed into Palm Beach Gardens. Um, when I look over your, um, your uh, documents that you have prepared for us, um, again, I'm in area one, and I don't believe that um, your, we meet the criteria as stated in the statutes. Um, I don't believe that the area is compact it, um, if, it, if it's 1,193.58 uh, acres, that is, is a really unusual um, uh, definition of compact. I also think that um, it's such a vast area, and I also do not believe that it is contiguous on three sides, and also I do not see that it, um, we are a substantially contiguous of Hidden Key and Palm Beach Gardens. Um, if you look at that map, we are, there is portions of the property that are contiguous uh, to Oak Brook Square, but the majority of the houses are not contiguous to Palm Beach Gardens. And therefore, we are not substantially contiguous. I do not, as a property owner, need or desire additional services and or the increased tax burden. Um, finally, I'd like to propose that you um, consider separating um, that zone one and allow different neighborhoods and different properties to determine their own destiny. Take Hidden Key and, you know, perhaps other properties that are east of US-1 and allow them to vote um, on the referendum themselves. Why put everybody into one gigantic zone um, that just doesn't seem fair and doesn't seem that it allows us to determine our own destiny. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. All right, so the last card for Ordinance 20 is for uh, Genevieve Deshaux. Does she still want to speak? Is not here? All right, just give me one moment.
All right, Max, do we have anything else before I close public hearing? Yes, Madam Mayor, just as a matter of, uh, for the record, I just wanted to make it clear that at this time, the city is entering into the evidence the entirety of the staff report, which is in the agenda package backup, which includes the annexation feasibility study for ordinance 2023. We want to make sure that that is entered into the record and it's clear that it is. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so with that, we've heard all the comments. I'm going to close the hearing. What we do now is we get a motion and a second to approve so we can bring it back for discussion, but we're going to wait until the chamber clears. So I'm going to just do a one minute inter intermission. If everybody could please kindly speak outside because we do need to continue the hearings. We are just allowing you to leave. And if you want to continue listening, you're welcome to, to do so. If we could just ask you to thank you.
Listening out, excuse me, if anyone listening in the lobby, we'll be reconvening in about a minute. You hear me now? Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Let's go ahead and open this hearing up again. We are on Ordinance 20, and I'm just about to see if we can get a motion in a second to approve. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we adopt Ordinance 2023 on first reading and based upon the evidence of the testimony presented, make the following findings of fact and conclusions of law that all conditions precedent necessary to hold this public hearing have been fully complied with pursuant to chapter 171 of Florida statute and that all requirements of section 171.042 Florida statutes has been fully satisfied and complied with and the character of the Eric to be annexed fully complies with the requirements set forth at section 171.043 Florida statute. Thank you so much Vice Mayor Woods. May I get a second please? Second. All right, thank you so much, Councilmember Middleton. Let's uh, bring it back for discussion. Um, does anyone have any comments they would like to add otherwise? Want me to start? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I can. I, thought, um, I just don't think it should be a panic um, within the community. You know, I've been here 40 years, worked for the city a long time in law enforcement, and um, and the city's been a checkerboard as long as, as, long as I can remember. So uh, the city of Palm Beach Gardens is a great city. Um, you, you would be more in a, a intimate relationship with the city and the, and the city council. We do care about what, how everybody feels. We live here. We're no different than whatever side of this dais you sit on. We're, we live here too. Um, uh, the accessibility to the community entity or amenities such as our park, soccer field, we're, we're spending a lot of money on our, uh, our pools, our recreation or whatever. So it's more of a, you know, I'm not government. I was elected into the city by uh, people that live here. Um, I don't have a government view on things, but I look at it as not a hostile thing. It's an invitation to, to come into the family. If you don't want to come into the family, then don't vote for it. So, um, you know, I don't know if you guys, you know, hidden key and people need attorneys and so on and that. It's a simple vote. So we would like to square off our boundaries. It makes sense. I would suggest you continue to get educated on the material because um, I don't want to. I don't want to contradict what how people feel and what they say on whether your taxes are going up, whether your taxes are going down or your life is going to change. Um, but this council probably wouldn't support, you know, a lifestyle change in, say, Cabana Colony. So I'm going to support the, um, uh, the vision of annexation, and then we're going to accept what, you know, what's, what the voter wants, and that's how it goes. And if you guys want to be in the city, great. If you don't want to be in the city, that's fine too. So I live in the city. I love the city. work here and uh, been a council member a long time. So that's how I feel about it, and that's the position. I'm going to stay on all of the ordinances. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Tana. Um, I, you know, I know there's several people still here, and I truly, truly appreciate all your comments. Um, and, you know, we, we do take them very seriously. I know that um, I have been asking a lot of questions over the past few weeks about this as well. I spent hours and hours. I read all the emails and I speak to, um, you know, all the people who are going through this process and ask a lot of the same questions that you have. Um, we want to make sure they're addressed. I know that, that this is not the first time 
um, that annexation has been brought to the table for the for you know these various areas. And um, so it might be new to some people, but it has been around for, for 20 years. People have been talking about annexing these parcels um, into the city or into another city, North Palm or Juneau. So I know a lot of things have been going on over the years, and there's a lot of history here as well. Um, I do have a couple questions about, um, and I don't know who, who can answer them within the city, about um, compact areas, definition of compact areas. We've already gone over the definition of compact area in the presentation, and I'm not going to debate the people from the public that have, that have offered testimony otherwise. Um, and the other thing I had was um, the commercial people who don't have a vote. You know, is there any kind of information we can give them as to how the city um, sees their commercial property? We can reach out to them and have a discussion with them. Um, their uses are their uses. Um, and we have historically, every time we've annexed a property, if we didn't have a zoning district that fit the area that was annexed, we created a zoning district so that we didn't take any uses or privileges away from anybody vis-a-vis -vis annexation. So we, to be clear, we don't pound the square peg into the round hole. So what we don't do is if they annex a property and there's something, our, our zoning districts don't exactly line up to it. We create a zoning district that matches the, privilege, the rights and the privileges that they have under the county's zoning code so that they're not divested. Thanks. I'll pass it on because I know other people have a lot of questions. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on Dana's comments, in terms of the annexation, it's, this has been going on for a few decades, discussions back and forth between the cities and the county and other things. So in, in, the way I look at it is, the city has done a wonderful job with communities out west and north in our city with annexation development and growth and i think we've planned very well for those areas we're building fire stations we have police presence we've expanded our services public services our recreation areas so now we're to the point where we can focus on the east side of the city which has been really ignored for the last 15 or 20 years on the annexation front but now we're to the point where the city is so strong um, the services are excellent. The things that we do here, um, I think, will benefit for the residents on both sides of the canal and as all, all the parcels to the south as well. So there's nothing hidden here. Statutory requirements have been met. There's no surprises. We're putting it on the most popular election, which is coming up in March. Um, so if people come out and vote for it, if they don't, we understand. But there's no hidden agenda here. Um, it's out in the open. And I think with being on the March election, which is where they're going to have the most participation, um, whoever votes for it, votes for it. Whoever doesn't, doesn't. And we'll live with the results of, of what comes in. So that's kind of the plan. All right. Thank you, Bert. Marcy. Thank you. Um, not to be repetitive, I'll just say that I agree with my fellow council members, my colleagues here on the, on the dais. Carl, I actually agree with what you said, um, very well spoken. Um, we, this is not a surprise. We've actually been talking about annexation since 2016. I'm holding up a uh, comprehensive annexation study from November 17, 2016, and that, that includes a lot of these areas that we've been talking about. We also had a, a meeting a, couple, a month ago in regards to this. Um, for all of the areas that we've already annexed, like our attorney said, we've made sure to create the land use, the zoning. We've never taken any property rights away. That's a very serious thing that we, we take very seriously. Um, I know that people have talked about uh, um, taxes and code enforcement that came up a couple times. Um, that's another thing that we also take very seriously. And uh, in many cases, because our millage rate is the lowest in the county, taxes will go down in many of these areas. Um, when it comes to code enforcement, we are not trying to, uh, to do anything different than what they already have there. Um, and we've already promised that when we've talked about it. Um, it's typical for cities to um, have overlapping annexation areas. Uh, again, we've had many conversations with our neighbors. Um, and, and now that we're uh, finally uh, taking this uh, to a vote, um, I feel like it's the most democratic, transparent approach to asking whether, and like Carl said, inviting you 
uh, whether you want to come into our city or not. And that's how we do it is by a vote. So um, I, I feel that it's the right way to do it. Thank you. All right, do we have any other comments or questions from council? Okay, um, so I'll just speak briefly. Uh, in the documents I've received and reviewed, we're looking at 34 years of discussion about annexation, um, starting back to some of the people who are working at the different municipalities that are concerned about this. We're, at, we're part of this conversation as well. Um, so this has been going back since May of 1989. Um, and uh, the first resolution for it here in the city was September 6th of 1990. This is not news. Uh, it's interesting when people are surprised because those are some of the people that were a large part of this over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, and um, we are talking about democracy and the opportunity for 8,500 people to vote of which tonight we had about 20, looks like we're gonna have about 25 or 26 people speak. So that, uh, that I think is quite a lot in just a few numbers. So that said, um, let's bring it to vote for Ordinance 20, 2023 at first reading. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We're gonna move on to Ordinance 21. 2023, if the clerk could please read the title. This will be for the area known as Ellison Wilson Parcels. Ordinance 21, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, annexing a contiguous and compact area of unincorporated real property, comprising a total of 20.27 acres more or less, commonly known as the Ellison Wilson Parcels, in accordance with section 171.0413 Florida statutes such parcels being generally located south of PGA Boulevard, east of the Intercoastal Waterway, and west of Ellis Ellison Wilson Road, as more particularly described herein and as depicted on the map attached here to, amending Article 2 of the City Charter to redefine the corporate limits pursuant to involuntary annexation, calling a referendum on the question of annexation for the registered electors within the property proposed for annexation, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of State, the Florida Governor's Office, and Palm Beach County, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. All right, thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to open the hearing for Ordinance 2123. We already did ex parte for Ordinance 20. I do have one comment card for this item, and that is for Sarah Williamson. So Sarah Williamson, if you could come to the podium, state your name, address, and if you have been sworn in, you'll get three minutes. Hi, my name is Sarah Williamson. I live at 11855 Ellison Wilson, and I have been sworn in. Um, I just want to let you guys know I strongly oppose any annexation whatsoever. Um, I'm sure you're very busy. You understand I'm very busy as well, so I won't waste your time. Um, personally, I feel like the vibe that Palm Beach Gardens proposes to our neighborhood already with the, I believe it's 86 foot new marina that I'll be looking at from my backyard, as well as the Ritz Carlton doesn't coincide with our values of our little cute kind of quaint neighborhood. And high density and high traffic hasn't really been negotiated properly. When they started to do the Ritz Carlton, the first thing I did was email the builder and say, have you done a traffic study? They were presenting it, they were bringing it in front of you guys and um, there was nothing. So people like me get to have traffic backed up in my front yard for ever. Every single time the bridge opens, every single day, multiple times a day. I think that the problem is that you guys have big visions for beautiful things like this community center, this beautiful thing, Palm Beach Gardens, Avenir, huge projects. I want to live in the hometown vibe that I have in my neighborhood. And I can't afford to lose it. So with that, I ask you if my money is really worth it and if it benefits you enough that you feel that you should take it. Um, I think I will lose. I feel passionately that I will lose. And I ask that you do not move forward with this. So, thank you. 
Thank you so much. All right, we, uh, we don't have any other comment cards for Ordinance 21-23. Um, Max, our city attorney, do we have any other, uh, anything else to add before closing public hearing? Comments? We just, the city is going to move into evidence the entirety of the staff report related to Ordinance 21-23, which is in the agenda package and includes the annexation feasibility study for Ordinance 21-23. Just want to make clear that it is part of the record. Thank you, Max. All right, so let's close the hearing. I'll need a motion and a second to bring it back for discussion. I'll move that we adopt Ordinance 21-2023 on first reading and based upon the evidence and testimony presented, make the following findings of fact and conclusions of law that all conditions precedent necessary to hold this public hearing have been fully complied with pursuant to Chapter 171, Florida State Statutes, and that the requirements of Section 171.042, Florida Statutes, have been fully satisfied and complied with, and that the character of the area to be annexed fully complies with the requirements set forth in Section 171.043, Florida Statutes. All right. Thank you, Vice Mayor Woods. May I get a second? I'll second. All right, thank you, Dana. So uh, do we have any other questions regarding Ordinance 21 or 23 or further discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Moving along to Ordinance 22-2023, if uh, the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 22-2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, annexing a contiguous and compact area of unincorporated real property comprising a total of 31.25 acres, more or less, commonly known as Pirate's Cove, in accordance with Section 171.0413 Florida Statutes, such parcels being generally located south of PGA Boulevard, west of the Intercoastal Waterway, and north of Canal Road, as more particularly described herein and as depicted on the map attached here too. Amending Article 2 of the City Charter to redefine the corporate limits pursuant to involuntary annexation, calling a referendum on the question of annexation for the registered electors within the property proposed for annexation, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of State, the Florida Governor's Office, and Palm Beach County, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and further purposes. All right, thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to open the hearing. We already declared ex parte under Ordinance 20, and I do have three comment cards on this um, item for Ordinance 22. We have Isabel Stevenson, Roberto Balbos, and Howard, P-R-I-N-N-O-U-S, Prinos III. So if Isabel could please come to the podium. Thank you. If you could, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, did I say? Yeah, it, you know, there are no cards for this. I don't believe there are any I cards. skipped ahead. Let me look. I did. Thank you, Patty. My apologies. I'm so sorry, ma'am. My reading glasses are not working really well as usual, so it's my fault. Okay, so Ordinance 22, we actually have no comment cards on this one, and that one is um, what we're going to go for next. Max, do we have anything else before I close the public hearing? Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, we'd like to enter into the, the, uh, in the record the entirety of the staff report related to Ordinance 22-2023. It's in the agenda package, and it includes the annexation feasibility study related to Ordinance 22-2023. All right. Thank you, Max. I'm going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second? Mayor, I'll move that we adopt Ordinance 22-2023 on first reading and based upon the evidence and testimony presented, make the following findings of fact and conclusions of law, that all conditions precedent necessary to hold this public hearing have been fully complied with pursuant to Chapter 171 of the Florida Statutes, and that the requirements section of 171.042 Florida Statutes have been fully satisfied and complied with, and that the character of the area to be annexed fully complies with the requirements set forth in Section 171.043 of Florida Statutes. Thank you so much, sir. May I get a second, please? I'll second. All right. Uh, I don't see any further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. And this is the one that will have the three comment cards. My apologies. All right. So this is going to be uh, Ordinance 23, 2023. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 23-2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, annexing a contiguous and compact area of unincorporated real property <clears throat> comprising a total of 32.92 acres, 
excuse me, more or less commonly known as Monet Acres. In accordance with section 171.0413 Florida statutes, such parcels being generally located on the northwest corner of the intersection of Prosperity Farms Road and RCA Boulevard as more particularly described herein and as depicted on the map attached here too. Amending Article 2 of the City Charter to redefine the corporate limits pursuant to involuntary annexation, calling a referendum on the question of annexation for the registered voter, registered electors within the property proposed for annexation, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of State, the Florida Governor's Office, and Palm Beach County, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, and providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to go ahead and open the hearing. We've already done ex parte under Ordinance 20. I do have three comment cards for Ordinance 23, and that again was Ms. Stevenson, uh, Mr. Balbos, and Mr. Prentice. So, Ms. Stevenson, I apologize. Would you please come up to the podium? Everyone else will get to speak afterwards. You'll have three minutes if you could kindly state your name, your address, and if you've been sworn in. Uh, my name is Isabel Stevenson. I live at 11148 Monet Lane. Uh, yes, I have been sworn in. And I'm here today because I do oppose the annexation. Um, Monet Lane is a street of 20 homes, one acre properties. Um, 30 years ago when I moved there, I was the new kid on the block. And pretty much at this age, I'm still the new kid on the block because most of my neighbors have lived there 40, 50, even 60 years, if not more. Um, we do not have city, city services. We do not have city water. We do not have city sewer. And I don't see the benefit in going with the, um, with the city of Palm Beach Gardens, which I do think it's a wonderful city, but I don't see where it's going to benefit our street. Because what are you going to do for us on our street? Are you going to repave our road? Are you going to bring in water? Are you going to bring in sewer? I don't think so, because if you did, then we'd all have to move because we wouldn't be able to afford it in the first place. So, you know, with that said, the way that we live on that one little street of 20 homes with residents that have been there lifetime and generations, then it's not a benefit to anyone for us. I think the other thing that we don't find fair is, you know, the whole, your whole program about having an enclave. Well, the, the property next to us is a mobile home park. It's a trailer park that's been there forever. It's a great little trailer park. There's 86 homes there, which are 0.06 acre lot. I mean, they're just a you know, little trailer lot where we are all one acre lots. Well, obviously, you know how property values have gone. 30 years ago, my property taxes were very low, and they still are. So now, because of our value, because we have an acre property, which we've waited 30 years to have that increase, just like everyone else, those taxes are going to go up, and we're still not going to have the benefit of the city services. I think Palm Beach Gardens is a great city. I love being here. I've lived here actually for 60, I don't want to say it, say it out loud, over 50 years, let's just say, and I, don't, I would not want to live anywhere else. But as far as the services that you're going to provide for our one little street, it's not going to benefit anyone on our street. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move on to Roberto Balbos and then Howard Pronos the third. Thank you, sir. Name, address, and if you've been sworn in. Name is Roberto Balbos, uh, 11130 Monet Lane. Uh, actually, uh, she expressed most of what I wanted to say. Have you been sworn you, in, sir? Sorry. Yes, yeah. I was sworn. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I won't repeat what she was uh, saying. Uh, a few things uh, in terms of um, uh, the, there's been an increase in the value of the properties in the last, say, 10, 15 years. And then uh, many reasons. One is the uh, fact that it's a very uh, pleasant rural uh, atmosphere, if you will. Also, that the lots are one acre in uh, size, which allows the building of a nice size building. So some of these buildings, uh, uh, three or four that are there, have increased the value of the whole uh, property. So it would be a great thing for me, you know, to have uh, that to give to my grandchildren if I can sell the property eventually. But uh, one of the things that bothered me 
Uh, it was the fact that the city, uh, the uh, planning director, uh, has, uh, uh, in the presentation, he did say that the city will be making a profit, I don't know, $70,000 a year or so, uh, because of the taxes that they collect versus the cost of the minimal service that they will provide to us. So that's $70,000, you know, that then we will have to be paying. And then the city can increase the, the uh, taxes if you want uh, at your volition in the future. So then we will be paying even more. And I have no idea what, the, what you will be giving me in terms of uh, service because I have everything I want, peace, tranquility, and one acre lot. Um, one of the things that uh, a problem in terms of um, uh, voting in this case is not quite um, voting uh, in the sense of everyone has a vote. Uh, because say what should be uh, deciding who can vote is who owns the property and then therefore everyone that owns the, a property, piece of property should vote and then also has to do with the size of the property and the value. Uh, and uh, the rules I think do not allow everyone to vote, you have to be registered voter. If you are from uh, uh, another country, uh, you may not vote. There's some rules that you may want to check if you want to have quote uh, democracy. Uh, anyway, so uh, I am against the, uh, the annexation. Uh, we did a, an informal survey of all the uh, uh, um, owners, and it's overwhelming the uh, rejection of the annexation attempt. So please take this into uh, consideration, but then we will all vote uh, no. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, Mr. Pranos the third. No? All right, we'll move along. Last call. Thank you so much. Do we have anything else that we need to do, Max, before I close the public hearing? Yes, Madam Mayor, as a matter of record, as is in the previous ones, I want to make, it this, make sure at this time that we're entering the entirety of the staff report and presentation into the agenda, which is all in the agenda package and includes the uh, annexation feasibility study uh, related to Ordinance 22-2023. Okay, thank you so much, Max. I'm going to close the hearing. May I get a motion and a second to approve and bring it back for discussion? I'll move that we adopt Ordinance 23-2023 on first reading and based upon the evidence and the testimony presented, make the following findings of fact and conclusions of law, that all conditions precedent necessary to hold the public hearings have been fully complied with pursuant to Chapter 171 of Florida Statutes, and that the requirements of Section 171.042 Florida Statutes has been fully satisfied and complied with, and that the character of the area to be annexed fully complies with the requirements set forth at Section 171.043 of Florida Statutes. Thank you, Carl. May I get a second, please? No second. All right. I just wanted to clarify, Madam Mayor, I misspoke. I think when I uh, entered things, things in the record, I, mi I misstated and said Ordinance 22. It's 23. Oh, I can see. I got it. All right. So this is for Ordinance 23-2023. Understood. All right, the hearing was already closed. We already have a motion. We have a second. Let's bring it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Moving along to Ordinance 24, if the clerk would kindly read the title. Ordinance 24, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, annexing a contiguous and compact area of unincorporated real property comprising a total of 38.71 acres, more or less, commonly known as Monet Gardens, in accordance with Section 171.0413 Florida Statutes. Such parcels being generally located north of RCA Boulevard, south of Fairchild Avenue, and east of Fairchild Gardens Avenue, as more particularly described herein, and is depicted on the map attached here too. Amending Article 2 of the City Charter to redefine the corporate limits pursuant to involuntary annexation, calling a referendum on the question of annexation for the registered electors within the property proposed for annexation, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of State, the Florida Governor's Office, and Palm Beach County, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for the purposes. All right, thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to go ahead and open the hearing. For Ordinance 24, 2023, we already did an ex parte on Ordinance 20. We do have one comment card for Ordinance 24, 2023. And I'd like to call Peter Battino to the uh, podium, please, sir. You'll uh, be so kind to state your name, your address, and if you've been sworn in. Yes, uh, good evening, Council. My name is Peter Banting. I live at 11147 Monet Ridge Road, and I was sworn in. Um, 
I am representing the area of annexation number five and probably the poster child for the enclave. We are the donut hole in the middle of Palm Beach Gardens. I've lived there for 21 years now and uh, this has been the day I've been looking forward to to get annexation. I support this thing fully. I've gone through numerous uh, road projects on my street and we don't have anybody who takes care of our roads. We're on well and septic. Uh, the roads deteriorate over time and you have to have them paved and going door to door to try to collect a check from everybody is not my idea of fun. Um, aside from the obvious lower taxes that most of the people in my area would, uh, would receive, the police, the fire, uh, services I believe would be far superior being fully surrounded by Palm Beach Gardens. So that is one benefit. And I'm hopeful some of my uh, resident friends will dive a little deeper. I heard a lot of negativity tonight and there are more benefits to be had for these annexations, at least in my area for sure, than people seem to uh, realize. So I've been in touch with staff uh, many times already to lend my support and I look forward to the next meetings that we'll have to hopefully get more information out there that leads people to believe these are benefits uh, and I look forward to that in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you coming. All right, we have no other comment cards. Max, do we have anything else that we need to add before I close the public hearing at all? Yes, Madam Mayor, as in the others, we need at this time to, uh, would like the city would like to enter into evidence uh, the entirety of the staff report and presentation, oh, yeah. which is in the agenda package and includes the annexation feasibility study for Ordinance 24 2023. Okay, make sure great. It's in the record. Thank you, Max. I appreciate it. I'm going to close the hearing. Could I get a motion and a second to approve? And we'll bring it back for discussion. Well, it's nice to end on a high, high note. So I will move that we adopt Ordinance 24 2023 on first reading and based upon the evidence and testimony presented, make the following findings of fact and conclusions of law that all the conditions precedent necessary to hold the public hearing have been fully complied with pursuant to Chapter 171 of the Florida Statutes, and that all requirements of Section 171.042 Florida Statutes have been fully satisfied and comply with, and that the character of the area to be annexed fully complies with the requirements set forth in Section 171.043 of the Florida Statutes. All right. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Vice Mayor Woods. Second by Marcy Tinsley. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any further discussion or questions from our council here. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Close the hearing. And let's move along to Ordinance 5, 2023. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 5, 2023. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78 Land Development at Article 3, Development Review Procedures by repealing Division 4, Citywide Impact Fees and Mobility Fees, and readopting same as revised in order to revise the City's impact fee schedule in accordance with the most recent localized data for Parks and Recreation, Fire Protection, EMS, Police Protection, and Public Facilities providing for and declaring the extraordinary circumstances that necessitate the adoption of the updated impact fees at the fully calculated rate as of the effective date of this ordinance, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. All right, great. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to go ahead and open the hearing for Ordinance 5 2023, and I will be calling staff to the podium first. Uh, I see that Joanne Escaria is here to present regarding Ordinance 5. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Um, my name is Joanne Scree, Assistant Director of Planning and Zoning, and the item before you this evening is a Land Development Regulations Amendment for Impact Fees, specifically Police, Fire, Parks and Recreation, and Public Facilities, including a finding of extraordinary circumstances to allow the impact fee schedule to be implemented immediately upon effective date at the fully calculated rate. For a little brat, Brief background, the previous impact fee update was conducted in 2016 and became effective in 2017. The current proposal updates the methodology to a more accurate plan-based fee versus a previous consumption fee. 
the cost of capital improvements has been accounted for, as well as construction costs and impacts of inflation. And now we'll have a presentation by our consultant. Our consultant is one of the leading experts in the state of Florida regarding impact fees and mobilities, mobility fees. He has a long list of clients, including the city of St. Augustine, city of Gainesville, and city of Port St. Lucie. Staff hired New Urban Concepts in 2022 to update the city's impact fee schedule. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jonathan Paul. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Joanne, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jonathan Paul. I'm the principal of New Urban Concepts, and tonight we're going to be presenting a um, update of the Park and Recreation, Fire Protection, and Emergency Medical Services, Police Protection, and Public Facilities Impact Fees for the City of Palm Beach Gardens. In addition to discussing what's known as extraordinary circumstances, which is a provision in statute related to increases in impact fees. All the items I'm going to discuss this evening are detailed in two separate documents available on the city's website. The one document is known as the Impact Fee Executive Summary, and that's really a, a summarization of a 200 plus page technical report. And this just really provides a, a high level overview of the calculated fees, um, doesn't provide any new information, but it's just a summarization of the overall detail. And then for all the things we're going to be talking about this evening, the more detailed report itself documents the data and methodology and analysis within those fees. As I mentioned earlier, this is an update of four of the existing fees within the City of Palm Beach Gardens, the Park and Recreation, Fire Protection, Police Protection, and Public Facilities. The City has two other fees, a mobility fee east of the Beeline Highway and a road impact fee west of the Beeline Highway. Neither of those are being updated this evening. Uh, they will potentially be updated at a future time. One of the um, impacts of any type of fee is its impact on affordable housing. Um, and the legislature has made a number of provisions in Florida statute that allows for either a reduction in fees for affordable housing or potentially a waiver of them outright. Um, the city has separate policies as it relates to residential uses. And then within those policies and programs, um, the city would be able to address impact fees, waivers, or reductions into the future. In terms of the calculations themselves, um, for residential uses, they are migrating from a, a use per dwelling unit to a use per square footage. So this would, in essence, allow for a smaller square footage uh, residents, apartments, condos, to actually pay a lower overall fee versus a higher fee for larger scale uses. So in terms of the fee calculation itself, that's one way to address affordability. Another means is through a separate program to either allow reduction or waivers. And I believe the city has a program um, to that effect that it can elect to move forward with those on. The city itself is projected to experience significant growth um, over the next 12 years. The base year that we looked at is 2022, and our future year was 2035. Um, the data analysis actually looks out as far as 2045, but in terms of a realistic, realistic um, projection of future growth, 2035 is our base year. Um, this does include areas within the city proper today in addition to areas that may annex into the city over the next 12 years. So the projection is the city population would increase by roughly 33,000 over those 12 years. Um, employment uses would increase by roughly 22,000. And all these factors go into the calculations of the impact fees themselves and then in what we call a, a functional equivalent resident. So this addresses a full-time resident to the city and also the employment within the city, not city employees, but private businesses, nonprofit, um, local government, all the folks that actually work in your city. There are adjustments made for those that both work and live in the city already. Um, and then in terms of fees, it's very common that people that live outside of the gardens but come in here and to work, they only use services part of the time. Therefore, they're not considered a, a full um, resident 
but they're known as a functional equivalent resident. So the number you see throughout the document itself is roughly 120,889. That's really the number we're using for planning purposes to identify future needs and the fee itself. The city's current comprehensive plan has level of service standards for parks and recreation. Today, these are applicable to residents only, and the standard is five acres of land for 1,000 residents. Uh, for your fire rescue level of service standard, it is based on response times to calls for services. For your police department, it's based on calls for service. And for public facilities, you do not have a standard today. Um, the five acres per 1,000 residents is a good standard for use in an impact fee. Um, response times and calls for service uh, are somewhat hard to quantify and also somewhat hard to tie directly to uh, new growth. Uh, in particular, your police department, um, if you look at its calls for service over the years, have taken a more um, community-based approach, a much more active engagement. So while your population's increased, your actually calls for service have stayed relatively level. And that isn't a reflection of there's not demand for their services, it's a reflection of you know, the services they're already providing today. So we're actually looked at as part of the fee, a, a separate unit of measure. Um, likewise, for fire rescue, uh, response time isn't something that's really easily quantified to new growth. So we looked at a separate standard service standard for that as well. For um, these existing fees, we look back over 10 years to what level of service the city provides today. Um, every year, your city administration produces a, a detailed annual budget and also a detailed state of the city where they track a number of measures. One of those happens to be level of service per resident. So we actually went back and recalculated this based on level of service per functional equivalent resident. So we capture both services being provided to employees as well as residents. And so over the 10-year the average, you provided roughly 3.73 acres of parks for both employment uses and residential uses. Fire rescue personnel were 1.84 personnel. That's both firefighters, EMS, and their support staff per 1,000 equivalent residents. Police personnel was 2.5, roughly, per 1,000 residents, and public facilities, which is your administration, your planning department, your public works department, uh, those folks that are not involved in park and recreations or life safety. We also look what you had budgeted in terms of your 2023 capital improvements program. And from that, we developed a level of service standards for impact fee purposes. We kept the five acres per thousand um, residents for parks, but we included both residents and equivalent residents. For fire rescue personnel, we use two personnel per thousand equivalent residents, police protection 2.5, and then for general government 2.3. So this allowed us to actually project out future space needs, future staffing needs, and also to work with your staff to develop a list of capital improvements. So we'll start first on the park and recreation system. Um, the city has a fairly robust parks and recreation system today. So the impact fee update addresses both acreage needed tied to new growth, in addition to proposed enhancements to your existing facilities. And you know, this isn't really necessarily to go over, it's really more or less a reference in your technical report. But your fee today is just based on the service provided in the past and based on the cost of facilities provided in the past. This plan and this fee is similar to the mobility fee you adopted, is that it looks in the future. So it looks at what do you need as a community to provide a level of service to your residents over the next 12 years. And we work closely with a number of your staff from various departments to identify the need for facilities and parks, the fire, the police, and public facilities and contains a detailed list of capital improvements. And the fee itself is based on those improvements. So there's a very clear connection between growth, the need for new capital facilities to serve that growth, and the cost of the fee. 
And then we, you know, there's a number of calculations that go into it, but at the end of the day, it results in a park impact fee rate. And that rate is what we use to actually calculate the park impact fee. Um, so one of the, the questions we get asked frequently is how do we compare to other uh, municipalities within the community? So we looked at park and recreation and what is being provided elsewhere within Palm Beach County for both municipalities and the county itself. Um, and just a, a caveat for anybody in the, the public or the audience who may be watching this, any specific detail on any other government other than Palm Beach Gardens, it's recommended you go visit their website for further detail. This is just a summarization of publicly available information. But the city of Boca Raton, um, the park and recreation impact fees, roughly $4,500 for a 2,000 to 4,000 square foot dwelling unit. Within the city of Wellington, it's $4,000 per dwelling unit. They don't really specify the size, just $4,000 per unit. Um, within the city of Royal Palm Beach, it's 2,200. Within Palm Beach County, it was calculated that 2,300 um, or $2,300 for this type of home the actual adopted rate had to be less um, because the county had um, made a demonstration or finding of extraordinary circumstances. The Board of County Commissioners didn't, allow, didn't elect to move forward with that. So essentially they had to phase the increase of their fee consistent with Florida statute. The Palm Beach Gardens fee today, absent an update of your impact fee, is $4,114. That's what a development comes in today. That's what they actually pay the city of Palm Beach Gardens. Um, the updated fee would be roughly $4,000. Uh, the one difference is this is based on a square foot metric versus a tiered number of square footage. So that fee is actually a little bit less than what you pay on a um, 2,500 square foot home or, or more. Um, so in, in that regards, anything under 3,000 square feet, they would pay a lower fee than today. Anything above 3,000 square feet, they would pay a higher fee because it's based on a per square foot basis. We looked at this for all the different types of land uses. Um, you know, just as a flat fee because it's based on square footage, all the residential's lower than today, substantially lower. But we also looked at what are the likely sizes of dwelling units to get a more accurate comparison. And the, the single family detached is slightly less than what it is today for a 3,000 square foot house. Um, for a single family attached, it used to be considered multifamily based on your current fee. Um, both your road impact fee and your mobility fee recognize that condos, duplexes, townhomes tend to have a greater impact than a multifamily use, and so they actually have separate rates. So the updated impact fees fall that same example. And, and I will just call out to note, um, there's a lot of data analysis that goes into the report. So for the data supports for single family detached, a fee upwards, assessed upwards to 9,500 square feet. For single family attached, up to 4,500 square feet and for multifamily up to 2,500 square feet. The data analysis supports these. Um, your, your city manager through your ordinance would have the ability to adjust these should someone come in and provide um, data to show to the contrary, or you as a, a body could elect to lower these thresholds. Um, but these are what the calculated numbers support. And you know, if we wanna go into, I have another section where I detail that we can discuss that further at the time if you'd like to. Um, one difference between the, the current park and recreation impact fee and the update is it is being applied to non-residential uses. So in, in four non-residential uses, it's the number of employees per thousand square foot that work there. Um, not visitors, not guests or clients or customers to a use, but the actual employees and it's also adjusted for what their reasonable availability that they could use the park system. So for most of the fee, it assumes that the parks would be available roughly 30 minutes of the day. Uh, for residential uses, it's available throughout the whole day. 
for employment uses, you know, whether they go before work, during their lunch break, or after work, just assuming that they have the access to these facilities for roughly 30 minutes out of the day, and the fee itself reflects that. And that is something that a lot of municipalities are moving towards that provide an active parks and recreation system like what you provide in the gardens. We also looked at the update of the fire rescue department impact fee. And similar to the other uses, it includes a detailed list of future needs. Um, over the next 12 years, there's a need for four additional fire stations, one of which you already have funded in fiscal year 23. So the, the fee calculation itself adjust the fee for that funded fire station. So it still shows you need four, but in terms of the calculation itself, it includes the funds that are set aside for that station, so new developments not being charged for that already funded fire station. That provides, that data analysis provides a fire and impact fee um, calculation similar to the other ones. The percentages have gone up anywhere from roughly 26% for a single family detached to 37% for a multifamily use. Um, there are a couple, there are three land uses, hotels, private education, and commercial storage um, that are all much higher. Um, for one, their base was fairly low to begin with, so any increase is gonna be a larger percentage um, for private education specifically, the old fee was based on a per student. Now it's going to a more easier to measure per thousand square foot. Uh, and for commercial storage, it was just extremely low. The data didn't support it. So the vast majority of uses for the fire protection and EMS impact fee roughly increased about 26%. Um, and given inflation that's occurred over the, the past few years, that's a fairly reasonable number in terms of overall percentage increase. I didn't include a comparison for fire in EMS um, because there's not a whole lot of other local governments within the county that have separate fire and EMS fees. Um, either they elect not to provide them or that service is provided by Palm Beach County. Um, so there are um, Delray and I know a few other communities are looking at the fee. Um, but not many of them have it for fire protection. We also looked at the fees for your police department, um, coordinated closely with uh, the, the staff there and determined both future space needs and also the needs for vehicles and equipment for a projected number of officers. Um, the future needs include the potential for either additional square footage to the existing building or more likely a, um, a police station serving the growing Western community uh, as part of overall Palm Beach County or Palm Beach Gardens growth. And then the, the fee calculations themselves take into account all the factors that went into the, uh, the fee itself and give us a, a rate of $219 per equivalent resident. And then that actually gives us our, our fee. Um, the police, has a slightly higher percentage, and part of that is because the lower the fees initially were lower. So anytime you have an increase and you start from a lower dollar amount, any increase on a percentage basis is going to be much larger. Um, so you know they're not necessarily dramatically increasing. It's just you started from a relatively low number to begin with, and that percentage increase uh, looks to be larger. So unlike fire rescue, where you looked at roughly a 26 percent increase. Uh, for police protection, you're looking at a 35 to 40% increase. Again, given that the last update was 2016, 2017, and we're now in 2023, seven years given inflation, I don't know that any of those numbers seem um, out of context. We also looked at public facilities, which is the building that we're in today. Um, and other expansion of facilities. The actual analysis called potentially for a greater square footage. Uh, the, the staff uh, on your, your facilities team look closely at the building you're providing today, 
how this space could potentially be reused to accommodate additional personnel, and we made some adjustments in terms of that. So projections into the future, um, the need was roughly 450 square feet per, per personnel. Um, they decided that 200 square feet was a better metric because there is existing capacity in the facilities, so that helped to actually keep the overall fee lower. Um, there are a few local governments within Palm Beach County that have public facility fees. Um, Royal Palm Beach, the fee is roughly $1,100 uh, for a 2,500 square foot home. Within Palm Beach County, it was calculated at $1,500 for that similar home. Um, they adopted a lower rate, $251, because of extraordinary circumstance. The gardens rate today is $231. Uh, the projected increase is to $275 for a 3,000 square foot house. Um, the overall park or the public facility increases average about 20% higher than what your existing fee is today, with the exception being the hotels, uh, private education, and commercial storage. So that, that sort of can, was a broad overview of the fee updates themselves. We're going to get into a little bit of just some of the factors we looked at and then also discuss further um, extraordinary circumstances. So in terms of going to a metric per square foot, we looked at data specific to Palm Beach Gardens, including population, dwelling units, and household size. And then we calculated that out for the different types of residential uses. We also looked at the number of bedrooms per square foot tier for all four different types of residential uses for condos, townhouses, single family, attached and detached. Looked at the, the number of bedrooms and the percentage of overall development. And as you'll see, and I'll point out here, all these examples are just for single family detached. Uh, the report itself goes into further detail where you see your number of bedrooms at five bedrooms, roughly there are a thousand dwelling units that were constructed between I believe, 2000, and 2000 and 2022. Roughly a thousand dwelling units, or just under 20%, had five bedrooms or more. And then you see a pretty substantial drop off six bedrooms, seven bedrooms, eight bedrooms. Um, there is still some growth, but it's a much uh, different rate. And you'll see that the, the five bedroom threshold is roughly equivalent to 7,000 square feet uh, in terms of a use. So if you, the data supports, as you can see that it's kind of a increase in number of bedrooms, increase in bedrooms per dwelling, increased percentage, increase overall numbers, but it does drop off pretty significantly after five bedrooms. So if you wanted to establish a, a lower threshold for single family, from the 9,500 to say a 7,000 or a different rate, uh, you could do that. Could also be done through the administrative process in the manual itself and the, uh, the impact fee ordinances. We also looked at employment uh, within the gardens, specific to Palm Beach Gardens, go into a lot of detail in the technical reports of that and how it relates to the impact of those uses. And that leaves us with what's known as extraordinary circumstances. This was an amendment passed in 2021 by the legislature, and it limits any increase in fees to no more than 50%. So if you have a calculated fee that's 100%, the maximum you could increase it is to 50%. So that's one threshold. The other requirement is if it's between 0.1% 0, 0 and a 25% increase, it has to be phased in over two years in equal increments. And if it's between 25.1%, up to 50%, it has to be phased in over four years. So there's a cap at 50% and then a phasing requirement, unless the local government is to be able to define extraordinary circumstance. Um, the legislature didn't define that term. It's largely been tied to growth in population. Um, in addition, other communities have looked at transitioning from a consumption-based system to a needs-based system as an extraordinary circumstance. But if you want to exceed these thresholds, you have to make a finding of extraordinary circumstance. 
you have to produce a technical report or a needs study, which is a document that was prepared for the city. That study can't be any older than 12 months. The study is roughly one month old at this point. You have to have two public workshops. Two workshops were held on the 19th, one at 9 a.m. and one at 6 p.m. And then finally, it requires a two-third vote of the city council. Um, so if super majority of you elect not to move forward to extraordinary circumstances, it would phase in under Florida statute. So it'd be 50% cap plus the, the phasing of the various uses. Um, the vast majority of uses fell under the 50% threshold. The three consistently that didn't were the overnight lodging, private education, commercial storage. Depending on how large a dwelling unit is at a certain square footage, it would also potentially exceed the 50% threshold as well. Um, so those are really the, the primary uses that are impacted. In terms of the, the basis, the finding for extraordinary circumstance, the, we looked at nine different metrics. The most important one being how fast has the city grown over time? And the, the baseline is, are you growing faster than the state of Florida? Yes or no. Florida, the state of Florida is one of the fastest growing states in the entire country. Many people would recognize it has extraordinary growth. Um, so if you're growing higher than that, you as a community can make a pretty strong case you have extraordinary circumstances and extraordinary growth. If you're growing less than that, you have to find other documentation. So between 2012 and 2022, the Palm Beach Gardens was growing quicker than the state of Florida and quicker than Palm Beach Co County. We look back at the 2010 timeframe, the 2020 timeframe, Again, the gardens was growing quicker than both of those, uh, the county and the state. We looked all the way back to 1990, um, and at that point, the, the city was growing quite rapidly. In fact, the city of Palm Beach Gardens, outside of Westlake, which is starting at a basis of 13 residents or 150, depending on what the data has been updated to, you are the fastest growing city in Palm Beach County um, by a, a pretty far margin. Um, and so that's one of the bases for the growth. We also looked at what's the growth projected to be out into the future, and is it still going to exceed the state of Florida? And will it still exceed Palm Beach County? And using just you know, a planning level term, medium projections and high projections, the state of Florida, uh, the Bureau of Economic Business Research, produces cost estimates every, or population estimates every year for counties and the state and they've factored into low, medium, and high. So we looked at both medium and high. Um, for the gardens, we looked at medium being no additional annexation and keeping your city limits as they are today. Into the future, we looked at what would happen if you annexed as a high growth projection. And under both of those scenarios, the, the, the city you know, well outpaced the county and the state. We also looked at the fact that you are transitioning to an improvements-driven plan, um, which is something that really a statute is looking to require, um, and depending on how you read it, does require it, and it's something that's more justifiable and there's also a direct connection between growth, the need for improvements, and the cost of those improvements. So these are all the bases that are laid out in the technical report. The two most significant being your extraordinary population growth in the past, projections for the future, and transitioning to a improvements-based system. Um, and I also say that the legislature, as you have seen as a body, um, has preempted a number of your powers as it relates to land use, as it relates to transportation concurrency. Um, there have been previous um, proposals to limit increases to 3% a year, regardless of what the study said, the maximum of 3%. Uh, so there's no guarantee that the legislature is going to continue to allow extraordinary circumstances. Um, and a lot of data and analysis has gone into it. You've transitioned to a plans-based improvement. So the hope is that when you update this five years from now, you're not seeing a 30, a 40, a 50% increase in these fees. You're seeing 10%, 15% because it's already projecting out into the future of what your needs are. 
So with that, I know that's covering a lot of ground and a lot of detail, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jonathan. You do a great job taking a lot of data and making it digestible. We really appreciate that. All right, we don't have any comment cards regarding... Um, uh, Madam Mayor? Oh, yes, ma'am. Just very quickly for the record. Yes, please. I just want to highlight some of the public outreach and, Excellent. Thank and you. next steps uh, for this item. So the Planning and Zoning Board did hear this item at the October 12th meeting and they recommended unanimous approval, seven to zero. This meeting, as well as all of the meetings, including the Planning and Zoning Board and the two required public workshops were all advertised in the Palm Beach Post. In addition, the proposed amendments were distributed to the development community and we have not received any comments to date. Um, First reading is scheduled for this evening. Second reading is scheduled for December 6th. And if the item uh, is approved, we would issue notice in December with the fees effective April 1st. And staff recommends approval. Thank you, Joanne. Sorry about that. All right. Again, I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. I am looking for a motion and a second to approve, and we'll bring it back for discussion. I'll make a motion on Ordinance 5 2023 that based upon the testimony of Mr. Paul and his technical report and study, um, I move to make a finding of extraordinary circumstances and to adopt Ordinance 5 2023 on first reading. A second. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Carl and then Dana. So, Carl, you made the motion. Do you have any questions or anything you'd like to discuss? No, I just kind of felt like that was a soft budget review. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, the city's growing. That's the direction we're, we're growing. There's no doubt that Palm Beach Gardens is probably one of the fastest growing cities in South Florida. Um, I'm going to support it because it needs to be done, and that's all I have to say on it. All right. Thanks. Any other comments, questions from council? No? All right. Marcy? I got comments. Oh, okay, Bert. Yeah, go for it. I could go on for a while on this. Oh, it's numbers. Oh, I love the numbers. <laughs> love it. But, um, basically all good so 2016 was our last survey um, we looked to do four to five years COVID got in the way so understandably you know we're at the point now where we need to significantly increase the numbers to kind of meet the projections maybe through 2035 uh, with another five-year review down the road to make sure that we're within the scope of where we need to be if not supplemental increases could be then but not as much as you said so that's all good to know um, I agree with extraordinary circumstances um, all across the board for all the different departments. Um, if we don't do that, we're going to have shortfalls of significant numbers, mm -hmm. whether we're growing just internally or growing with annexation. So uh, we have to do this, and I'm totally supportive of doing it um, not on the backs of our existing residents, but doing it on the backs of the residents and the commercial developments that want to come into the city, because that's where the traffic, the growth, a lot of the issues are going to come from. So um, great report on that. 23% um, growth without annexation, potentially up to 50% growth with annexation if that all comes in over the next decade. Um, so we have to be cognizant of that, of what we're trying to incorporate into our city and make sure we have those services covered. Uh, the state of Florida, um, you know, no, no, two, no two cities are the same. Um, legislature up there, we can't afford caps on those numbers when we have, you know, 30% plus growth, if that turns out to be the case compared to other cities that might be 5% where they can afford a lesser scope. So I don't want that to happen. So I think we need to implement right away. Um, I think we're giving enough time for the permit status to take effect. We're given over 120 days from the second vote where I think legislature it's 90 days or legally it's 90 days. So I think we're given ample time and notice. Haven't had much discussion with commercial developers at all on this. So I think they see that Maybe they got a little break up front because of COVID that we haven't made adjustments significantly to accommodate for growth that they're bringing to our city. So I, I think we're there. Um, outside of that, um, great report. Uh, thank you for all your work. And uh, I love the numbers. So I could, you know, <laughs> I printed it out and I read it and kind of made my highlights. But uh, really highlighting the areas that we need to incorporate improvements into and that number difference between your anticipated funding the way we are now compared to where we need to be it's pretty scary so i, I think the, the increases across the board are justified and um, i'm happy to move forward with it thank you mayor thanks bert all right marcy thank you i, I do agree with uh, your comments i have a, just a couple questions 
Um, and I did like the report. I read it. I watched the um, workshop twice, actually, so I can make sure to understand everything because it was a lot of information to digest. Um, I guess in our land development code, and I do understand what you were talking about with the bedrooms, with the single family, detached, et cetera. Um, in our land development code, of course, parking is based on bedrooms. And I was just curious um, as to why uh, in the residential methodology, because obviously bedrooms equal people, why is it that it's based on square footage and not bedrooms? I was just curious as to how that um, occurred or why. That's a great, it is a great question. And it's something a lot of, um, it's been a big transition to go from most communities have done per dwelling unit, regardless of size. Um, a number of communities are starting to migrate to the square footage. And I don't think there's, there's as much data out there yet. You know, we, the level I went down to to get down to the Palm Beach Gardens, the specific data isn't something you normally you find or you do. Um, and so it isn't, that common a practice yet to base on a number of bedrooms. I think five years from now, the next update, as it starts to transition to that, especially for the multifamily use, we probably would recommend a change to bedrooms. Um, but again, the data is just starting to come out now that, you know, because I mean, you look at a lot of communities who have a multifamily, they say a studio is the same exact impact as a three bedroom apartment. Oh, really? You know, That's and, and, and you just look at it on its face, but, you know, the data the is not there to justify what everybody knows is likely true, um, but they are actually starting to look at it. And, and really, trip generation leads it for a lot of these fees. So the next update of the trip generation, they're going to look more at bedrooms. And that just will give us a solid basis. The square footage, the details, the documentation, it's really easy to justify. Okay. But um, no, next time go around, at least for multifamily, um, you're potentially going to transition to bedrooms. Thank you. And um, are there any other municipalities in the county or um, maybe cities or uh, counties in the state that utilize this um, methodology? All the ones that I've been working on for the past 20 years do. Uh, I've been a, we actually did the, the residential per square foot in Alachua County over 20 years ago when I worked there and all the communities I've been going to, it makes sense, you know, especially from a, your community is a little bit different because you have a, a much higher end demographic and your units tend to be much larger to begin with. Right. A lot of the communities I work in, you see a far greater differential in terms of square footage size. So you see a lot smaller units, some higher units. So they actually, a lot of those communities benefit by going to a per square foot rate. But it is something I've been using. It's something, it's how builders actually price permits on a square foot basis. Um, and so it's something that's been fairly well received. Thank you. And I guess in summary, it's, you know, it, it appears to me that the methodology keeps us from falling behind. I think uh, Bert touched on that as well, or um, always having to play catch up. So I can appreciate that. And I was originally concerned about you know, increasing residential in general because affordability is a big issue and that concerns me. Um, but this does make total sense and I also realize that the approach is forward thinking and um, proactive instead of reactive and I, you have to jump in somehow and sometime and some way. So I think this is the best way to do it um, and the methodology totally makes sense so therefore I'm going to support it. Thank you very much for all this data. I too love data and uh, appreciate all your work and staff's work to even bring this before us. Thank you very much and your staff was great. They were extremely helpful from yeah. you know from fire rescue parks recreation police protection um your your city manager the given direction that they were all really helpful in helping to develop the capital improvements and really fine tuning it so the rate you know reasonably reflects the growth um and i think it's reflective of the needs of the community as well so we love hearing them because we love them yeah. too <laughs> all right any other comments questions from council at all no, none. none. Yes. All right, great. So, yeah, personally, again, I love the future thinking of this staff. It's amazing bringing you in. Great data. We're so appreciative. Very impressive that we're the fastest growing municipality, faster than the county, fastest in the state. It's extraordinary. Extra it's extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> so uh, let's move along, and I'm going to close the hearing. Let's uh,
get, oh, we did that. Sorry. <laughs> Let's do a vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you guys so much for your time. Excellent presentation. All right, moving along to Ordinance 12, 2023. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 12, 2023, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78 Land Development at Article 5, Supplementary District Regulations, Division 5, Natural Resources and Environmental environmentally significant lands, section 78-249, approval criteria for proposed land alteration to remove references to the urban growth boundary and at section 78-250, preserve area requirements to allow minor alterations in preserves, providing that each and every other section and subsection of chapter 78 land development shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you, Patty. Let's go ahead and open the hearing. Staff, has anything changed since first reading? No, Madam Mayor. No right. changes since first reading. Thank you. Does our staff, uh, council need a, <laughs> does council need a presentation? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so let's move along. We don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I please get a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 12, 2023? I'll make a motion that I'm all out of motions. Second. All right, so all in favor? Did you hear what I Aye. said? What did you say? <laughs> I made a joke. You guys weren't even listening. Oh, <laughs> Let me, I'll redo it since you're all sleeping. That's why I didn't second oh, we're here. Yeah, whatever. I'll make okay. a motion on Ordinance 12, 2023 on second reading. Thank you. Second. 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 We're all scared now. Second. I <laughs> seconded it. All right. Motion passes unanimous. Oh, wait. Vote. Let's, all in so favor? So Carl made the motion and Marcy seconded, correct? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now. That was my bad. Sorry. Thank Got you, you Carl. Track. But it sounded jumbly, but we just thought you were done. It's all good. All right. Moving along. Ordinance 18, Ordinance 19 will both be read together. So Ordinance 18, 2023 and Ordinance 19, 2023 was a combined presentation on October 5th, 2023 at first reading. Since Ordinance 19 is quasi-judicial, we're going to explore, um, excuse me, declare ex parte at this time. The clerk will read the title separately for each and there will be a vote for each on Ordinance second reading. So um, if the clerk could please read the title. And then we'll do ex parte. Ordinance 18, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a small scale amendment to its comprehensive plan, future land use map in accordance with the mandate set forth in Chapter 163, Florida Statutes, pursuant to application number CPSS 23 08 000, in order to change the land use designation of 13.45 acres, more or less from Palm Beach County Commercial High with underlying high residential, 12 units per acre CH12 high residential, 12 units per acre HR12 and residential low, three units per acre RL3 to Palm Beach Gardens residential high RH with the Marina District overlay. The subject property being located on the southwest corner of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road, providing for compliance with all requirements of Chapter 163 Florida statutes providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, providing that the future land use map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and further purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm gonna go ahead and open the hearing. Let's go down the line and declare ex parte for both Ordinance 18, 2023 and Ordinance 19, 2023. I will start with Carl, any ex parte? None? Negative on both. Dana? No. All right, Bert? None. Marcy? Yes. Dan Canalthuma. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I have none. St um, Council, do we need another presentation for Ordinance 18 and 19 again? All right. Thank you. But, but just to clarify, there are no yeah. changes. Either. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't have any comment cards. And so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. If I could get a motion in a second to approve Ordinance 18. I'll make a motion to move Ordinance 18. 2023 on second reading and adoption. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, let's go ahead and read the title for Ordinance 19, please. Ordinance 19, 2023, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain real property 
such property being comprised of 13.45 acres in size, more or less, and located on the southwest corner of the intersection of PGA Boulevard and Ellison Wilson Road, providing that these parcels of real property, which are more particularly described herein, shall be rezoned from Palm Beach County Residential Plan Unit Development, PUD, and Multifamily Residential Medium Density, RM, to Palm Beach Gardens Plan Unit Development, PUD, overlay, with an underlying zoning designation of Residential High, RH, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. All right, thank you so much, Patty. I'm gonna open the hearing. Um, we did ex uh, declare ex parte for a ordinance 18 and 19 together. Has anything changed since first reading? No, Madam Mayor, no changes. All right, thank you so much. So again, this was a combined presentations with ordinance 18. Do we need a presentation on 19? Thank you so much. I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I please get a motion and a second to approve? I'll Madam make a Mayor, motion. I'll, I'll move Ordinance 19 2023, second reading and adoption. I'll second. Okay, fabulous. I don't see any conversation. Let's go ahead and bring it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously for Ordinance 8, 19 2023. All right, moving right along to Ordinance 25. Ordinance 25 and Ordinance 26 will be a combined presentation. The clerk is going to read the titles separately, and each ordinance will be voted on separately. Since Ordinance 26 is quasi-judicial, we're going to do ex parte, and the clerk, again, will be reading the titles separately for each, so there'll be a separate vote for each on first reading. If the clerk could please read the title for Ordinance 25-2023. Ordinance 25-2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a small-scale amendment to the Comprehensive Plan Future Land Use Map in accordance with the mandate set forth in Chapter 163 Florida Statutes, pursuant to application number CPSS-23-08-0001, in order to change the land use designation of 29.59 acres, more or less, known as the shops at Indian Trail from Palm Beach County Commercial Low with underlying rural residential one unit per five acres, CLRR-5 to Palm Beach Gardens Commercial C, the subject property being located on the southwest corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and Coconut Boulevard, providing for compliance with all requirements of Chapter 163 Florida Statutes, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, providing that the future land use map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. All right, thank you so much, Patty. I'm gonna go ahead and open the hearing. Let's declare ex parte. Do we have any ex parte for ordinance 25? And or I guess we'll just do the ordinance 25. Anyone have ex parte for 25? Negative. Negative, no? No. No, no. no. Marcy? All right, no. lovely. So let's go ahead. We have a staff presentation from Natalie Crowley. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. Natalie Crowley, Director of Planning and Zoning, and I have been sworn in. I am going to be making a very brief presentation uh, for Council for this item that is before you, for these items that are before you, uh, which are primarily housekeeping in nature, which is simply to assign a city future land use designation and a city zoning designation to uh, a parcel of land following annexation. Uh, on May of 2023, the site was annexed into the city as part of the larger Western North Lake area. Um, the area or the specific parcel is commonly referred to shops at Indian Trails. It's located on the south west corner of Coconut and North Lake Boulevard and the map of that parcel is on the screen before you. Um, so this is the existing county land use de designation. It, it's a mix of commercial and uh, RR5 and the proposed designation is the most comparable which is commercial. So uh, upon adoption it'll include the uh, commercial city land use designation. The county zoning designation is MUPD and the city is providing for a PUD with an under underlining designation of CG1. Um, the property has been duly noticed and ads were published and staff is, uh, this was transmitted to the Interlocal Plan Amendment Review Committee uh, and we have received no comments. The P PZAB board recommended approval seven to zero and staff is recommending approval of both ordinance 25 and 26. Excellent, thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, I don't have any comment cards, so I'm uh, gonna go ahead and close the hearing. 
May I please get a motion and a second to approve, and we'll bring it back for discussion. I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 25-2023. I'll second. All right. Thank you so much, Marcy and Dana. Let's bring it back for discussion. And do we have anything to chat about for this? You passed the motion? No. Nope. Okay. Very clear. All right. Lovely. Thank you so much for the housekeeping presentation. Let's go ahead and take it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and finish off with Ordinance 26. Patty, if you could be so kind as to read the title. Ordinance 26, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, assigning a city zoning designation to certain real property, such property being comprised of 29.59 acres in size, more or less, known as the Shops at Indian Trails, and located on the southwest corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and Coconut Boulevard, providing these parcels of real property which are more particularly described herein, shall be rezoned from Palm Beach County Multiple Use Plan Development, MUPD, to Palm Beach Gardens Plan Unit Development, PUD, overlay with an underlying zoning designation of General Commercial CG1, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. All right, thank you so much, Patty. I'm gonna open the hearing. Again, a quick ex parte, since it's probably the same. Carl, ex parte? No. Dana? No. None. Okay. None, None for me either. So we're going to, uh, we did have the presentation as part of Ordinance 25. I don't have any comment cards, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the hearing. May I please get a motion in a second to approve Ordinance 26? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 26, 2023. I'll second. Okay, we're awake. Uh, let's bring it to vote because I don't see any further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Moving along to Ordinance 27, 2023. If the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 27, 2023, an ordinance to the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78, Land Development at Section 78-221, PGA Boulevard Corridor Overlay, by repealing subsection D1B13 and readopting same as revised to permit health, physical fitness, weight reduction, and spa as a major conditional use in the PGA Boulevard corridor overlay, providing each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 78 land development shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. All right, great. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm going to open the hearing. And we have Olivia Ellison. Yes, good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Olivia Ellison with Planning and Zoning. And I'll be presenting Ordinance 27 2023, which, which is an applicant initiated petition to request a land development regulations text amendment to our PGA Boulevard corridor overlay to allow health, physical fitness, weight reduction, and spa as a major conditional use. And this use is permitted today in certain zoning districts. We have general commercial and also intensive commercial zoning districts it's per permitted in, and it's allowed as a minor conditional use in neighborhood commercial and research and light industrial zoning districts. However, it's not permitted within this overlay. And this overlay that I'm mentioning is our PGA Boulevard corridor overlay, which protects PGA Boulevard's main street character and includes boundaries that front includes lands that front PGA Boulevard for a depth of a thousand feet and if any PUD or PCD fronts PGA Boulevard then all parcels within that project is also included in that overlay regardless of depth and here's the definition of health physical fitness weight reduction and spa use and I'm not going to read the definition from the screen, but I will tell you it's basically a facility that includes a variety of activities designed to improve health. It's a fancy way to say a gym. <laughs> And here's the proposed amendment. It's a snippet of our code, our PGA corridor overlay code. And you'll see right here in red that use is added to the personal services category. And you'll see these two asterisks. And those two asterisks mean, yes, it's allowed in the PGA corridor. However, you do have to go through a major conditional use process. And this process is very similar to any major amendment process in the city. You have to demonstrate compliance. It's reviewed by our development review committee. And then after certification, it goes to our public hearing process, which includes planning, zoning, and appeals board, recommendation to the city council. And then our city council, you guys, are our decision-making authority. And this ordinance has been publicly noticed in accordance with city code 
And our PZAP board did see this at our October 10th meeting and they recommended approval with a vote of seven to zero and staff recommends approval as well. And spoiler alert, Legacy Place will be moving forward with a major conditional use request. They are included in the PGA overlay um, and to include a gym within their project. And that's at their next, our next city council meeting. Thank you very much. That was really lively, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Nicole, Nicole, are you adding anything to that? Are you, are we having any other presentation? No, okay. um, Legacy Place, uh, or Nicole with Collar and Herring, who is representing Legacy Place, will be giving a full uh, presentation upon second reading at the December City Council meeting and also presenting the major conditional use request. We appreciate that, and thank you so much for your patience this evening and for being here. We appreciate that a lot. All right, I don't have any comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I please get a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 27-2023? I'll make a motion to approve Ordinance 27, 2023. All right. Second. Thank you, Marcy and Burt. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. Moving right along to Ordinance 28, if the clerk could please read the title. Ordinance 28, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 62, streets, sidewalks, and certain other public places by adopting new Section 62-33 entitled Streetlights in Non-City-Owned Rights-of-Way, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 62, streets, sidewalks, and certain other public places shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. All right, so Max, have there been any changes on this since uh, first reading? No, oh, Madam Mayor. I need to open the hearing, I apologize. Max, are there any changes? There are still no changes, no. Okay. <laughs> Do we need a presentation? No. <laughs> you have to stop giggling. <laughs> and we have no comment cards, so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I please get a motion and a second to approve? Madam I'll Mayor, I'll move Ordinance 28, 2023 on second reading and adoption. I'll second. I really appreciate that, especially for this ordinance. Everybody, thank you so much. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed to Ordinance 20, 20, um, 28, 2023? Motion passes. Excellent. All right, moving along to Ordinance 29 at first reading. Patty, if you could please read the title. Ordinance 29, 2023, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 42, Offenses at Article 1, General Offenses, by adopting new Section 42-4, entitled Control of Access to City-Owned, Controlled, and Leased Property, in order to implement regulations related to public access to such properties, permit and prohibit conduct within same, and authorize the city manager to manage such properties, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 42 offenses shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you so much, Patty. I'm gonna open the hearing. Max, if you could just take a moment to explain Ordinance 29, please. Certainly, Madam Mayor. Um, as, as we have set forth in our staff report, the city owns and controls and leases substantial facilities, properties, and public infrastructure. And um, we're bringing this to you because we've determined that a need exists to provide reasonable time, place, and manner regulations uh, regarding public access to and the public's conduct within city-owned, controlled, and leased properties. Uh, it's not the intention of the staff to proffer something for your consideration that would regulate the content of any person or entity's speech in any manner or form whatsoever, but to only place reasonable time, place, and manner regulations on their speech. Uh, consistent with, with recent federal court decisions, public access to areas within enclosed facilities owned, controlled, or leased by the city may be restricted depending on whether such areas are classified as a designated public forum limited designated public forum or non-public forum. What this ordinance will do is it will designate certain areas with this, within the city as public forums, limited, not, limited uh, designated public forums, or a designated public forum. As is right now for the council chamber, um, we, we, this is a publicly noticed meeting and this will be a public forum. People will be allowed to video record and audio record uh, the proceedings. In our limited public forums, forums, people will no longer be allowed to video or audio record in the limited public forums without the consent of every individual in that 
space that could end up on the video or be picked up on the audio. One of the reasons we've seen a need for this is that there has been a proliferation of, well, I, I hate to use the word First Amendment auditors because I think it's unnecessarily pejorative against the First Amendment. They're basically people that use the First Amendment as a sword and then try to use it as a shield to um, permit their um, really kind of just rude and uncivil behavior. What they do is they come in and staff members are, say, for example, sitting out here at the lobby. Um, our personnel that sit out there at that desk aren't just sitting there all day looking cute. They're actually doing work. Um, they're on their computers. They're doing things. They're conducting public business. And people will come in and shove a video camera in their face or an audio recording device in an attempt to antagonize or disrupt their ability to do work under the guise that it's an expression of their First Amendment rights. Um, it happens very frequently with our, uh, our first responders, both our police officers and our fire and EMS personnel. And it's important that uh, our employees be allowed to conduct the public business. If you're here on a legitimate public business, that's not a problem whatsoever, and we encourage it. And as you well know, the staff here under Mr. Ferris's leadership is very focused on serving the public and meeting their needs to the best of our abilities. But they shouldn't be abused and they shouldn't be tormented and the work of the public should not be disrupted. The taxpayers that are not here trying to disrupt public work are paying for those services, and it's important that they get their money's worth. That's what this ordinance will do. It will empower our police officers to um, issue uh, trespass citations and take any other necessary steps under the law that they deem prudent. I know the chief will end up adopting uh, certain policies about how our officers implement portions of this in, con in conjunction with the city manager. And this will allow us to designate areas like our lobby, the lobbies in our, uh, all the public areas in our, in our golf clubhouse and tennis clubhouse, um, our um, operations center, um, our logistics center, our police department, our fire departments, the lobby areas are, will be designated as limited public forums. And it will not allow people to come in there and videotape and audio record without the people's consent. And it will designate all the security areas in our facilities as non-public forums. Um, people are not, the public are not generally a, uh, um, have access to those areas anyway. And then areas like this, even this council chamber will be a limited public forum except for the times when we have a publicly noticed meeting. And that's what it is. Um, I have to give credit to the city of Punta Gorda. This ordinance is largely theirs. I customized it for our needs, um, but I can't claim the pride of authorship. I thought this was exceptionally well done by them. Uh, the ordinance was challenged in the Middle District and U.S. Federal Court in the Middle District of Florida, and they successfully defended it, and it was not appealed to the 11th Circuit. So it's the law of the state, and it's, uh, it's good law, and it will protect uh, the staff that you uh, care about so much. And it will also... Um, Protect the public. People that are doing things that are, uh, want to legitimately exercise their First Amendment rights will still be able to do so. They just won't be able to do so in an abusive manner. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Max, for that. I don't have any comment cards on Ordinance 29-2023, and so I'm going to go ahead and close the hearing. May I please get a motion and a second to approve? I will proudly make a, a motion to approve Ordinance 2029 on behalf of our city staff on first reading. Excellent. I'll second. Thank you so much. Do we have any discussion, questions, or otherwise? From I don't think we should open Pandora's box on that. All right. Leave it alone. <laughs> Do you have anything to say? There is none. There is All none. right. Let's take it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you so much. Let's move along to Resolution 67, 2023, please. Resolution 67, 2023, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, expressing the city's support for the State of Israel, providing an effective date for the purposes. All right, so I, um, do we have any discussion regarding this at all from Council before we go ahead? Okay, I do not have any comment cards, so may I get a motion and a second to approve? I'd like to make a motion to approve Resolution 67, 2023. I'll second. All right. Any further discussion before we close that one out? All right. Let's take it to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Resolution 67, 2023 passes unanimously, and we are moving on to items for council action and discussion or items of interest. Are there any items from our council tonight? I do have one thing to say, um, and I do, I should have said it before, but I do want to thank everyone that put resolution 67 together, and I really appreciate that. Um, but with that said, I also want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving and know that I'm very grateful for all of you. 
um, of course, my family and my friends, and the fact that I have been able to joy, enjoy living in the beautiful city of Palm Beach Gardens for over two decades. So happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Anyone else have anything to say? I could just say ditto, and I've lived here over five decades. Ha uh ha. -huh. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? I just want to do a quick shout out to our recreation department for throwing the most amazing fall festival ever, as well as our media department for broadcasting it and making it extraordinary. So thank you all so much. I believe, Charlotte, you said it was 11,000 people. <laughs> so, all right. So you guys are amazing. I could probably go on and on and on, but we were going to call tonight. Max, do you have a city um, attorney report? No, ma'am. With that, we have no other business, and I am going to adjourn this meeting.